The Royal Commission is now in session. Good morning, uh, everybody. This is the fourth day of uh, the uh, hearing of the Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability, dealing with the experiences of violence, uh, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability from culturally and linguistically diverse uh, communities. We begin with an acknowledgement of country. This hearing is being held on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and we wish to acknowledge uh, them as traditional owners and to pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We would also like to pay our respects uh, to elders past, present and emerging of other communities who may be here today or who are following the hearing uh, via the live web webcast. I mentioned that uh, Commissioner Gelberley will not be joining us uh, today. Uh, she is unable to be present. However, she will, of course, follow the uh, proceedings uh, through uh, the transcript and uh, the uh, recording, uh, video recording of the proceedings today. Yes, Ms. East. Uh, good morning, Commissioners, and good morning, everyone in the room and those following the uh, live broadcast. I'm very pleased, uh, Commissioners, to i uh, tell you that our next witness is the Australian Race Discrimination Commissioner, Mr Chin Tan, and he's in the witness box now. He's uh, taken his oath of affirmation, and if the commissioners are ready, we can proceed. Yes, please do. Uh, Thank your, you. your name is Chin Tan? Yes, I am. And you are the Australian Race Discrimination Commissioner? That's what I'm known as, yes. And we have your uh, professional address at the Human Rights Commission. You've provided that to us. And you've also made a statement, is that right? That's correct. And the commissioners have a copy of the commissioner's statement dated the 30th of September 2022. Yes, Are there we, any... have, we have that and we've had the opportunity to read it. Thank you very much. Yep. And are Thank there you. any changes that you wish to make to that statement? Um, not that I'm aware of at this stage. And its contents are true and correct? Yes, as far as I'm aware. Of. Now, can I introduce you a little more formally? You commenced your role as the Race Discrimination Commissioner on the 8th of October 2018. That's correct. And prior to joining the Australian Human Rights Commission, you spent three years as the Director for Multicultural Engagement at Swinburne University of Technology here in Melbourne. That's correct. And your focus at Swinburne University as uh, head of its cultural diversity strategy was to work collaboratively across the university and the wider community to ensure that Swinburne succeeded as an institution of cultural diversity excellence. That's right. And you've also been the chairperson and statutory head of the Victorian Multicultural Commission. That's true. And the commission has had the opportunity to hear from the current uh, chair of the commission, Vivian Nguyen, yesterday. You held that role between 2011 and 2015. That's right. That's true. And before that, you've had a successful career of more than 24 years practising as a lawyer. That's true. Including a holding partnership roles in a number of Melbourne I firms. practice, but as to what in fact was successful, I'll leave to someone else to decide. That's okay. what well, I'm very happy to report that the uh, Human Rights Commission describes that as a successful career. <laughs> that is a very becoming piece of modesty, unusual. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the... Australian Human Rights Commission, and particularly the work that you've done as Race Discrimination Commissioner, has focused on a number of important initiatives. The anti-racism framework that's will soon to be released, I think, in full, yes. but also the relaunch of the Racism Stops With Me campaign. So in the statement, which I think you're going to read to us now, you cover some of those important topics and I might ask you a few questions about those matters and other matters Happy at the end. Yourself, yeah. So thank you, Commissioner. Over to you, and I invite you to read your statement. Well, the pleasure is mine, and thank you, all Commissioners. Uh, never had uh, the chance, to, uh, Your Honour, to appear before you in my 24 years of successful legal practice, uh, but it is a, a privilege, obviously, to appear before the Commissioners today, uh, particularly uh, a jurist as eminent as yourself, uh, and obviously, 
uh, Commissioner um, uh, uh, Alastair is known to me, and um, he served as a colleague of mine some uh, year, a few years ago uh, before he embarked on this illustrious role as Royal Commissioner. And to you, uh, Commissioner um, Bennett, um, I've let, read your background, very distinguished career in serving the community, particularly in the area of disability. So thank you for that opportunity to appear before you all. But very quickly, I know you have uh, had the opportunity to read the statement, but I thought I'll perhaps uh, re-emphasize the issues in there by going to the document again uh, today for the benefit of those here with us today. So thank you for the opportunity to appear today and provide this statement. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we gather on, the Bunarong Bung Warang and Wurundjeri Waiwari peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and acknowledge their connection to land, waters, and community. I extend that respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present today. And as requested, uh, I will focus on specific matters relating to people with disability of culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. The Racial Discrimination Act of 1975, the RDA, gives effects to obligations under the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. The legislation makes it unlawful to discriminate against a person because of race, color, descent, national, ethnic origin, or immigrant status. The legal protection from racial discrimination extends across many areas of public life, including employment, education, getting or using services, renting or buying a house or unit, and accessing public places. The RDA also makes racial hatred unlawful. Section 20 of the legislation establishes the statutory role of the Race Discrimination Commissioner and its functions within the Australian Human Rights Commission. These functions include the promotion of an understanding and acceptance of and compliance with the RDA, as well as the development and conduct of research and educational programs for the purpose of combating racial discrimination and prejudices that lead to racial discrimination and promoting understanding, tolerance, and friendship among racial and ethnic groups. In undertaking these functions, I work with governments, with governments, with business, community partners, education providers, the media and workplaces to help individuals and organizations understand their rights and meet their legal obligations and responsibilities. My current strategic priorities include leading a national anti-racism framework project on the Racism It Stops At Me National Public Awareness Education Campaign. The racism is a significant social, economic, and national security threat to Australia and to our community um, as a whole. The Human Rights Commission called for a national anti-racism framework in March 2021 in response to heightened racism in Australia and across the globe in recent years, including racism among and arising within the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. A concept paper proposed guiding principles, outcomes, and strategies to start a national conversation about the vision and scope of a framework. A national and an anti-racism framework is intended to be a collective project steered by a human rights-based approach. The guiding principles for a human rights-based approach are participation, accountability, non-discrimination, and equality, empowerment, and legality. A framework will be a long-term central reference point to guide actions on anti-racism across all sectors and aims to develop to national discussions about anti-racism and anti-racist strategies. A coordinated shared vision to tackle racism, promote racial equality, ensure access to rights and foster a cohesive sense of belonging for all Australians. From March 2021 to April 2022, the Human Rights Commission undertook initial scoping consultations with peak and community organizations, experts, service providers, human rights agencies, and all levels of government 
to guide the vision and scope of a framework. From October 2021 to February 2022, the Human Rights Commission received submissions on a framework from individuals, organizations, big bodies, experts, and researchers. Now, across the consultations and submissions, several themes were consistently identified as key priorities, including First Nations sovereignty and truth telling, definitions of racism and anti racism, intersectionality the importance of prevalence, severity, and impact data, education and awareness raising, cultural safety in workplaces and service provision, enhanced access to rights and awareness raising around legislative protections and complaints mechanisms, independent oversight mechanisms, media standards and regulation, community engagement and accountability, including via evaluation and measured indicators. The Human Rights Commission will release the scoping findings in late 2022. In keeping with human rights-based approach, the Human Rights Commission intends the next stages or the next stage of developing a framework to become one that is community-centric through nationwide consultations, ensuring anti-racism efforts reflect community priorities, and draw on community strengths, knowledge, and expertise. Since 2012, the Racism Stops Me campaign has helped people and organizations learn about the nature and impact of racism, providing tools to stand against it and to act for positive change. In early 2021, the Human Rights Commission initiated a, fresh, a refresh of the campaign to provide supporters with the tools to engage in current conversations and challenge racism in their workplaces, communities, and schools. This involved designing and developing a new public awareness campaign and accompanying educational resources, website, workplace cultural diversity tool. Launched in July 2022, the new iteration of the campaign urges Australians to reflect on racism and act against it. It aims to support Australians, particularly those without lived experience of racism, to understand how racism shapes society and the need to act for action to address it. The new website provides resources to support education about and against racism, featuring in-depth information about racism in a range of settings referenced in the advertising campaign, including institutional and systemic racism. The Workplace Cultural Diversity Tool is a free, confidential self-assessment tool for organizations seeking to strengthen their structural approach to cultural diversity and anti-racism in the workplace. Community and stakeholder views were an important part of the refresh and consultation strategy implemented by the Commission. Two expert advisory groups advised on the development of the public awareness campaign and the workplace cultural diversity tool made up of experienced academics, practitioners, and advocates for a, from a range of industries and cultural backgrounds, each with expertise in anti-racism and the promotion of cultural diversity and inclusion. Across the framework project and the campaign refreshed, a common theme was how there is a lack of broad public awareness of how experiences of living with disability can intersect with and compound experiences of racism. In consultations, the Human Rights Commission also heard about the need for stronger representation of people from culturally and linguistically diverse communities with disabilities in public anti-racism campaigns. Human Rights Commission heard from people with disability of culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds about the challenges they face in accessing and engaging with support services in Australia. From the outset, inequalities, compromise access to support services, operating at a structural level where interlocking historically entrenched systems of power work to limit access to and create culturally unsafe service delivery. Intersectionality does not merely involve 
the confluence of race and disability, but also other social categories such as sexuality, religion, and migrant, refugee, and asylum seekers' backgrounds. These categories, when combined, create novel challenges for inequitable access of support for disability. Evidence already presented to this Royal Commission and outlined in its issues papers acknowledges and demonstrates this. While migrants and refugees, for example, encounter a range of difficulties in accessing support services, such as inadequate culturally specific communication, resulting in a lack of awareness of available government support, economic difficulties, and a lack of safe transport options, these take on new forms when encountered by culturally and linguistically diverse people with disability. In the context of the pandemic, where many services pivoted to online delivery, these barriers are amplified, dovetailing with a lack of digital equipment, internet, and tech literacy. Inclusion in support services requires an intersectional approach. Even when people with disability of culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds can access support services, a lack of intersectional understanding pervades service delivery. During the framework consultations, those from migrant, refugee, and faith-based communities described to the commission how the disability sector is very European and how they experience dissonance and discrimination because of a lack of cultural safety in service delivery. Ensuring cultural safety, respect and inclusion for culturally and linguistically diverse people with disability is paramount. Cultural safe service provision recognizes how practitioners' cultural, professional, and institutional positionality informs interactions and service provision. When service providers are culturally safe, they create environments that are accessible, respond to the needs of communities, and draw on their strengths. Developing cultural safety service requires support for community-controlled service provision, <laughs> community empowerment, and trauma-informed and healing approaches to service delivery, and anti-racist competencies to underpin a service delivery. A culturally safe approach also requires accountability. Sustaining cultural safe services is an ongoing process built upon continuous reflection and meaningful relationships. It must always be aimed at the empowerment, healing, and self-determination of communities. Responding meaningfully to the experiences and priorities of those from migrant, refugee, and faith-based communities requires an intersectional approach. For grounding intersectional experiences of race and racism as they manifest interpersonally, institutionally, and systemically is a guiding theme for my work on a national anti-racism framework and the campaign. In its initial report about framework, about the framework that we are initiating, the Human Rights Commission will emphasize intersectionality as a guiding principle of an effective and anti-racism approach to policy making. Consultations and submissions reflected an array of intersectional experiences across personal, social, cultural, economic, and political contexts. The principle of intersectionality will guide the, pro the progress of the project as a framework promotes a national coordinated vision of anti-racism and intersectional approach will seek to address how racism presents itself in individual and context-specific ways. Taking an intersectional approach will be crucial to progressing anti-racism in the areas of cultural safety and improve legal protections against racism. In a similar way, intersectionality was identified as key to public, raising public awareness in the Racism Stop With Me campaign, which sought to represent and articulate intersectionality and the experiences of intersectional um, of nature for negatively racialized people. For this reason, the campaign prioritized ambassadors and talents with diverse experiences of racial, of racism and discrimination, including ambassadors with disability from culturally and linguistically diverse communities. These ambassadors spoke 
to their experience of multiple forms of discrimination and the strength drawn from their communities to overcome structural barriers. The campaign acknowledges that active anti-racism will work, will look to and cooperate differently in different circumstances, providing tools and resources that can be adapted by individuals and organizations in their own lives and contexts. An understanding of intersectionality supported the campaign's shift from a focus on interpersonal racism to institutional and systemic racism, where entrenched patterns and structures of power overlap and interlock to perpetuate intersectional harms. And those who participated in the framework project identified the inadequacy of legal remedies to meaningfully address discrimination and barriers to accessing legal protections to the Human Rights Commission. A need for timely and meaningful remedies was highlighted and the lack of adequate redress through current legal mechanisms for the issue of systemic racism was raised. Project participants shared that most people who encounter racism do not report it and highlighted barriers to accessing existing legal protections. The key barriers to reporting racism can be broadly categorized into external and internal barriers. External barriers include fear of consequences of reporting, such as retaliation by the offender or exacerbating an already vulnerable situation or relationship, lack of trust in official agencies, such as possible discrimination by the police or likelihood of having their cases dismissed or ignored and accessibility issues. External barriers are interlinked with internal barriers, which include internalizing negative experiences of reporting or racist, of racist incidents into hopelessness or normalizing of hate and lack of awareness of one's rights and reporting avenues. The importance of increasing the safety and accessibility of reporting mechanisms was stressed in consultations. Third party community initiatives were highlighted as examples of safe, accessible, and independent platforms where individuals and communities feel comfortable sharing and documenting experiences even where a resolution was not possible. Participants emphasized the need for any, report, any reporting mechanisms to be anonymous and independent from any institutions. So individuals are offered protection from potential retaliation. Beyond reporting mechanisms, communities raise further solutions to address reporting barriers, particularly the lack of awareness of rights in those who make and respond to incident reports. Uh, they include creating awareness of campaigns against relevant rights and reporting avenues, providing response teams with training about specific communities' needs, improving operational responses to reports of discrimination and hate, conducting genuine community engagement, centering community input and participation, and ensuring the mechanism is community-led, culturally safe, and trauma-informed. Across the framework project, the Commission, the Human Rights Commission, heard about the need for effective legal protections and complaint pending mechanisms and systems that acknowledge intersectionality and address intersectional concerns embedded within the formal structures with respect to people with disability or culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds using Australian discrimination laws to make complaints and seek remedies from the Human Rights Commission. The free and equal in Australian conversation on human rights reform agenda led by the chair of the Human Rights Commission, the Emeritus Professor um, Croucher, as an effective means to provide valuable guidance for protection of people from disability. The free and equal project has found that current discrimination laws are outmoded, do not provide effective rem remediation for discrimination, are inaccessible and need significant reform to support 21st century Australia's needs. It proposed four reform areas, building a preventative culture, modernizing the regulatory framework, enhancing access to justice, and improving practical operational laws. 
The reform agenda includes the principle that federal discrimination law should be intersectional. This principle asserts protections for different attributes must be able to work together easily, recognizing, for example, that having different tests for different attributes creates complexity and having to litigate discrimination in relation to each attribute separately is burdensome and less effective. This complexity creates challenges for the community to understand their rights and responsibilities under discrimination laws. Part three of the discrimination Disability Discrimination Act permits a public, uh, permits public authorities, employers, educational institutions, and providers of goods, services, and facilities to develop action plans concerning ways in which they will act to achieve the objects of the legislation. In its reform agenda, the Human Rights Commission notes that action plans should be a measure available across all discrimination laws as part of a suite of voluntary measures and a strategy in addressing issues of intersectionality where inequalities may raise issues across more than one of the federal discrimination acts. When considering improving the practical operations of laws, the Human Rights Commission outlines reforms for managing intersectionality in law and practice and posits further reform options. This work will be a touchstone to the, in the human rights approach to reshaping human rights and their promotion and protection in Australia. It will guide my work in particular on the framework, including as it relates to the making of complaints and available remedies. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, thank you very much, Commissioner. Now, do you mind if I ask you a few questions arising from the very comprehensive overview of the work the Human Rights Commission is doing and your leadership? One of the issues arising in this hearing has been the importance of culturally safe practices and whether such safe practices can operate as a safeguard against violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation. In the work that the Commission has done and your work on the National Anti-Racism Framework, do you have a view about culturally safe practices operating as a safeguard against violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation? Well, we, we have a, um, well, thank you for that question. We, we have a very clear view arising from particularly the latest consultations from the framework that culturally safe workplaces and culturally safe services are the essential building blocks for eradicating violence, abuse, neglect, and exploitation of people with disability. And the framework scoping project, the commission have heard extensively from the communities that a culturally safe workplace provides the necessary groundwork for culturally safe service delivery. And um, they describe to us how racism affects the capacity of some to obtain work, for example, and how racial discrimination faced within the workplace impacts the employers, uh, sorry, the employees' career progression and retention as well as their well being. And we've heard the highlighting that these experiences were exacerbated when racial discrimination intersected with other forms of discrimination including in relation to disability as well as gender, age, visa status, and discrimination based on English language proficiency and accent. So cultural safety was identified uh, by many project participants and, and from our own research um, and the work that we have done previously as a best practice approach to addressing race-based barriers and harms experience in relation to job seeking and especially within the workplace. The commission have also heard that cultural safety must be embedded at the institutional level as well. And that's including in terms of implementational and operational mechanisms, uh, pro uh, procedures such as anti-racist recruitment and hiring practices, the mentoring and retention practices, cultural accommodation that can support staff with lived experiences of racism, ongoing mandatory training that spans cultural awareness and competency and 
anti-racism and foster racial literacy. And this is indeed needed to right through from the different levels of this institution to the executive level. Employees and workplace executives must be accountable and to be able to show leadership to the above requirements via professional development or KPIs, for examples. And safe and transparent reporting mechanisms are needed for staff who experience racial discrimination within their workplace. Um, enforcement uh, mechanisms are also needed. So cultural safety uh, is for us a threshold uh, issue that is a starting point and its principles can be applied to a broader application for the safety of staff uh, in the workplace, including for people with disability and, and particularly with people uh, from the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and from other negatively racialized community. Okay. One issue you touched on in your speech was about redress and remediation and remedies for people who may experience discrimination in an intersectional way. And you've said that there are some limitations in the current Australian discrimination laws. How do complainants currently seek redress if they have intersectional experiences of discrimination? The process and procedures that uh, apply in the Human Rights Commission is pretty well worn um, and um, tried, um, even though there are limitations. Um, to what currently applies. Um, complainants would take uh, the complaints uh, to the commission and they'll be guided on where they can place those complaints. And if it's a matter which relates to a possible intersectionality of number of complaints, uh, then they will be dealt through the process of uh, having this individual's complaints uh, channeled to the various um, operative acts, and in my case, the Race Discrimination Act. Um, and this is where the complainants will have their uh, remedies uh, sought and addressed through each of these separate channels. So for us, um, this becomes a very complex, unwieldy, and difficult um, and burdensome responsibility on a complainant to have to navigate to different legislations to find um, a complaint mechanism that is responsive and capable of looking into their intersectional needs as a person who could be uh, looking and dealing with complaint based on disability, race, and perhaps even gender. The definition of race discrimination in the Racial Discrimination Act is different to the definitions of discrimination in the Disability Discrimination Act. And I know the chair mm. in his former life has um, looked at that definition of race discrimination in the RDA in some detail. Is the uh, problem around how discrimination is dealt with in the legislation being different and having different protections for mm. people? Mm. One of the uh, key themes has arisen from the consultations we have conducted on the framework, um, of which the one of the top six issues that are recent uh, was the need for a definition of racism, and I extend it to discrimination as well. Uh, even in the area of racism, uh, there is a wide consensus that we don't always know what we mean, mm. and the level, particularly in the legislative, uh, you know, uh, approach about where protections. Uh, can be provided to people at what levels. Mm. And so this underscore what you have said about the differing, differing definition of discrimination and different acts on, and portends for me exactly the kind of issues we're talking about, mm. that people run to different tests to navigate um, the complaints mechanism to get the kind of uh, remedy that they seek. And it is part of that free and um, equal uh, project agenda that we are seeking to find ways to alleviate that issue. So it is, it is uh, an issue of concern to us that we are possibly looking more in depth with greater clarity about what we need to do to provide protection 
uh, and for, for better um, services delivery in terms of the legislative framework for people with multiple uh, attributes of complaints. My last question, and the commissioners may have some comments or questions, is a theme we heard yesterday from uh, one panel was the importance of leadership within mm -hmm. community. And I wanted to ask you about leadership in the context of intersectionality and what is the importance of having leaders and campaign ambassadors who have experience of discrimination in that intersectional way? One of the big um, issues that the firm actually a recent considerably in terms of tackling racism, what in fact we're looking at the workplace or what in fact in schools or the community generally uh, is about the need for authentic uh, leadership. And there is a maxim that, um, you know, we, we used um, in the work that we do that um, you can't be what you can't see. And, and, and that means uh, in terms of an organization or a community setting, having the right sort of structures that embody a capacity for senior people, particularly in organization, to be able to lead and advocate and to be able to entrench clear values and principles about the issues that, that we're confronting with and particularly about discrimination. So, and we've taken that out further in that the work that we have done in particularly with Rhythm Stuff and Me campaign to in fact import and uh, utilize many from the communities who have different attributes uh, of needs in the hope that this will in fact project to the community uh, a very clear sense of empathy about issues that confront people in a very real and lived experience way. So uh, it is an issue that for us is terribly important uh, to be able to design mechanisms and systems that provide for leaders that are authentic in the work that they do and supporting and understanding the crucial issues about discrimination, but more about having systems in place that would in fact reinforce accountability as well. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, our Royal Commissioners may have some questions. Thank you very much uh, for your evidence. Uh, I'll ask my colleagues whether they have any questions for you. First, Commissioner McEwen. I don't have any questions, but I do want to thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Commissioner Bennett. Huh? And, and uh, Chair, if I could just uh, perhaps before I leave, yes, um, just, just uh, perhaps just to, uh, I suppose in, in a very neat way, summarize. It's not a summation, to, but, but it is to, uh, it's a kind of take home message, if you were. Uh, that I thought it'd be important to reemphasize for all the things that we've said today. Uh, number one, there is a lack of broad public awareness of how experience of living with disability can intersect with and compound experiences of racism. Secondly, there's a need to focus on the importance of taking an intersectional approach to, to discrimination as a guiding principle in solutions to address abuse, violence, neglect, and exploitation of peoples of disability. And thirdly, um, and this is not in my material, but um, something that I thought is important that I share, that while discrimination of people with disability from the culturally and linguistically diverse community is real and remains a serious concern and challenge and needs, and that needs to be addressed. The, the better approach in ensuring that people with disability from the uh, called community are better cared for and protected is to approach the issue from the lens of providing and applying a more comprehensive, responsive and intersectional approach this, to disability care and protection. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. I did have one uh, question, if you don't yes, mind. In paragraph 53 of your statement, you indicate uh, that those mm. who participated in the project identified the inadequacy of legal remedies to meaningfully address discrimination and barriers accessing legal protections to the Australian Human Rights Commission. Mm. Did you have any particular proposals or suggestions that might address that uh, deficiency? 
Yes, uh, Chair. Um, much of the work has been taken up uh, in the leadership through the Free and Equal uh, project because uh, they are looking at the big picture legislative framework uh, protection issues. Uh, from my end, uh, coming through the racism spectrum, uh, I'm keen to ensure that we, number one, provide for a protection that is capable of addressing lived experience of people in a very tangible um, and, and clear uh, way, but more so to provide inadequacy of remedies that currently there are obviously some limitations to our, our system. It is, after all, a mediation consultation process. And, and people are, uh, if they are unhappy or aren't able to obtain the remedies that they seek, are forced to go to the court systems. And most of the people who are talking about don't have the means or the capacity or the knowledge or the ability to do so. And so it's about access to the system and the responsiveness of the system to provide and cater for the specific needs of people with different and, need, and needs and different background of wants. Uh, this is about cultural diversity. I've, I've spent uh, the last 10 odd years and more on cultural diversity. Diversity provides for a difference for which there will be a different set of needs and requirements. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how adequate is our system in providing for that? Well, we've heard uh, before, and commissioners are familiar with the consequences of the Brandy decision in the High Court, yes. which limits the powers of the commission. These are just the constitutional facts of life with which, uh, no doubt, you and others have to live. And, and, and the question is, um, how do we keep enlarging this protection yeah. to our legal system? Yeah. Well, thank you very much Pleasure for uh, your statement uh, today and uh, for coming to the Royal Commission to give uh, evidence. We very much appreciate thank your you. assistance. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Eastman, Commissioner. What do, uh, we, what do we do now? Well, I would, if it's convenient, just um, ask you to receive the Commissioner's statement into evidence yes. and mark it Exhibit 29.03. Yes, that statement will be admitted into evidence and given the marking of Exhibit 29-03. And then if we just have a very short adjournment, it's not morning tea yet, but we just need <laughs> to reconstitute the hearing room for our next witness. Thank so you very five, much. five or so minutes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you again, uh, Commissioner, and we'll thank have you. a short adjournment. Oh, thank you for having me. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is resumed. Yes, Ms. Eastman. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. Our next witness will be uh, identified by the name Mr. Rahman. Before I introduce him, I just need to take some appearances from his uh, legal representative. Yes, by, by all means. Uh, Mr. Bhattacharya, appearing for Mr. Rahman. Thank you very much. Mr. Rahman, thank you very much for coming to the Royal Commission. Thank you too for the statement that you have provided, which we have and which we have read. So we appreciate uh, your assistance in being prepared to give uh, evidence. Um, I will ask- no, uh, we've, done the, we've done the affirmations. Yes, no, no, I was going to say, I will ask Ms. Eastman now to ask you some questions. All right, thank you. <laughs> Uh, if I can just explain to those following uh, Mr. Rahman's evidence, he has given his affirmation. Uh, he's accompanied by an interpreter who has also given his affirmation. Commissioners, you have a written statement. What we propose to do is I'm going to read parts of the statement. I'll pause at the end of each paragraph and then the interpreter will ensure that Mr. Rahman knows what I have said. He will let me know if there's anything that he wants to say in response to a particular paragraph. 
and there are a few issues that we'll expand on as we go through. So that's the... And I take it the translation will be from English into Bengali and Bengali into English. Yep. Um, Mr. Rahman does speak some English and he will let us know if there's any concerns that he has as we go along. So uh, may I start? Yes. This statement is made by me accurately sets out the evidence that I am prepared to give to the Royal Commission into violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability. This statement is true and correct to the best of my knowledge and belief. So the idea statement of BP that I did see, that I am proud of, the Royal Commission, that I mean, showing that that was Durbabahar, Abohala, and Shari, maybe, Protibondi, look, don't you think that that man, Shujukson, Shujukger, be aware of it. সেই সম্পর্কিত যে কমিশন সেই কমিশনের সামনে উপস্থাপন করার জন্য আমি বক্তব্যটা প্রদান করছি আমার জানা মতে এই বক্তব্যের এই বিপিটির মধ্যে যে বক্তব্য প্রতিফলিত হয়েছে তার সত্য এবং আমি বিশ্বাস করি তার সর্বব্যাপী সত্য বই অন্য কিছু নয় ইয়েস কমিশনারস আই এম অ্যাবাউট টু স্টার্ট দ্য স্টেটমেন্ট এন্ড সাম অফ দ্য ম্যাটারস দ্যাট আই উইল রিড আউট টুডে পিপল মে ফাইন্ড ভেরি ডিস্ট্রেসিং এন্ড কনফ্রন্টিং এন্ড সো আই গিভ দোজ ফলোইং দ্য ব্রডকাস্ট uh, a warning and commissioners, as you've said, there are the counselling numbers and the information available on the Royal Commission's website if anyone requires assistance. <coughs> Thank you. I am to talk about this now. I am going to talk about it. 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 Okay. Okay. My background. I am a refugee. I am a 36-year-old man. I was born in Bangladesh and my first language is Bengali. Yes. Yes. I was born with a severe spinal condition, congenital short stature, severe kyphoscoliosis, which is a chest deformity and restricts my lungs. I was born with a very strong body, 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 I was born with a very Okay. My physical health is very bad and includes hypertension and chronic back pain. I find it very hard to sleep during the night and will often sleep during the day. I am unable to stand for longer than about 20 minutes. I also cannot sit for long periods and I need to alternate between standing up and sitting down. I spend a lot of time lying down. Amar sharirik obostha otthonto dur obosthay ase ami ebong amar uchu matray uchcho chap ebong dirghokalin pichoner betha ba pither bethay akranto hoy ami rattikalin ঘুমাইতে পারি না আমার জন্য খুব কষ্টকর হয় আমি সাধারণত দিনের বেলা ঘুমিয়ে থাকি আমি একাধারে বিশ মিনিটের অধিক দাঁড়িয়ে থাকতে পারি না এবং আমি বেশিক্ষণ একসাথে এক জায়গায় বসে থাকতে পারি না এবং এই সময়কালে যখন আমি দাঁড়িয়ে থাকি আমাকে পায়ের উপর ভর পরিবর্তন করতে হয় এক পা থেকে অন্য পায়ের উপর ভর পরিবর্তন করতে হয় এবং আমি বসা থাকা অবস্থাতেও এক পাশ থেকে অন্য পাশে আমার ভর স্থানান্তর করতে হয় আমি অনেক সময় ব্যয় করি শুয়ে থাকা শুয়ে থাকতে অনেক সময় ব্যয় করি আই লিভ উইথ ডিপ্রেশন অ্যান্ড অ্যাংজাইটি মাই ডক্টর টোল্ড মে দ্যাট আই প্রবলি হ্যাভ পোস্ট ট্রোমেটিক স্ট্রেস ডিসঅর্ডার and I have provided to the Royal Commission a letter from my doctor outlining my disability and physical and mental health conditions. I am a 
এবং আমরা দুশ্চিন্তায় ভুগি আমার ডাক্তার বলেছে যে আমার সম্ভবত পোস্টমার্টিক স্ট্রেস ডিসঅর্ডার এই রোগে আমি আক্রান্ত এই সংক্রান্ত একটি চিঠি ডাক্তারের কাছ থেকে লেখা চিঠি আমি রয়্যাল কমিশনে ইতিমধ্যে জমা দিয়েছি I feel very stressed. Sometimes I wonder, why did God give me this life? I don't see any light. I can only see darkness. I just want a life, nothing else. I don't see any light. 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 আমি আমার জীবনে কোনো আলো দেখি না আমি শুধুমাত্র অন্ধকার দেখতে পাই আমার জীবনে এবং ভবিষ্যতে কিন্তু আমি শুধু একটা জীবন চাই এর বেশি কিছু চাই না আমি শুধু একটা স্বাভাবিক জীবন যাপন করতে চাই I was in Christmas Island for about three months, after which I was transferred to the mainland Australia for medical treatment. After receiving treatment on the mainland, I was handcuffed and returned to Christmas Island against my doctor's medical advice, where I stayed for about one year. It was humiliating to be handcuffed and treated like a criminal. Uh- উনিশ দুই হাজার তেরো সালে আমি একজন আশ্রয় প্রার্থী হিসেবে অস্ট্রেলিয়াতে আগমন করি আমাকে প্রথমে নেওয়া হয় ক্রিসমাস আইল্যান্ড ডিটেনশন সেন্টারে অস্ট্রেলিয়ান বর্ডার ফোর্স কর্তৃক আমি ক্রিসমাস আইল্যান্ডে ছিলাম প্রায় তিন মাস এবং তার পরবর্তীতে আমাকে অস্ট্রেলিয়ার মূল ভূমিতে চিকিৎসার জন্য প্রেরণ করা হয় অস্ট্রেলিয়ার মূল ভূমিতে চিকিৎসা শেষে আমাকে হাত করা পরিয়ে ক্রিসমাস আইল্যান্ডে ফেরত নেওয়া হয় আমার ডাক্তারের স্বাস্থ্যগত সুপারিশ এর বিপরীতে আমি ক্রিসমাস আইল্যান্ডে আরও বছরখানেক ছিলাম আমি অত্যন্ত মানে আপনার অপমানজনক অবস্থায় আমাকে হ্যান্ডকাপ পরিয়ে ক্রিসমাস আইল্যান্ডে নেওয়া হয়েছিল এবং আমাকে আমার সঙ্গে একজন অপরাধী বা ক্রিমিনালের মতো আচরণ করা হয়েছিল এই হচ্ছে আমার এক মানে ডিটেনশন সেন্টারে ডাক্তার যখন আমাকে তখন তারপরে আমি মনে করি আমার এটা দেওয়ার কারণে সে আমার উপরে এরকম নির্যাতন করছে অকমান করছে আমার জীবনটা যেন ওইটা আমি দেখলাম যেন আমার মৃত্যু সে ভালো এরকম অকমান করা আসছে মাই ফিলিং ওয়াজ লাইক দ্যাট দ্যাট আই ওয়াজ হিউমিলিয়েটেড বাই দি অথরিটি বিকজ মাই ডক্টর রিকমেন্ডেড মি দ্যাট আই ওয়াজ এন ডিজেবল পারসন and uh, as if i made a criminal activity is being a disabled person and that's why i was humiliated i felt like that at that time that i could have died um, uh, rather than being humiliated after this i was transferred to nauru where i stayed until 2019 during this time i was found to be a refugee পরবর্তীতে আমাকে নাউরুতে স্থানান্তরিত করা হয় সেখানে আমি ছিলাম দুই হাজার উনিশ সাল অবধি এই সময়কালে আমাকে রিফিউজি বা রিফিউজি হিসেবে আমি পরিগণিত রিফিউজি স্ট্যাটাস আমাকে দেওয়া হয় আই সাফার টেরেবলি অন নাউরু আইম নট দ্য সেম পার্সন দ্যাট আই ওয়াজ এস ফার এজ আইম কনসার্ন আই ফিল দ্যাট আই এক্সপিরিয়েন্স সাইকোলজিক্যাল টর্চার অন নাউরু I lived in a plastic tent with 25 to 30 other people. I had a small bed and no fan, despite the heat and humidity in Nauru. I found it very hard to sleep, and there were very limited toilet and shower facilities. 
it was hard to access clean drinking water and often we were provided water that had not been properly purified. I had to line up for food for hours. Because of my disability, I could not always stand in line and would often go without food. Whilst on Nauru, I spent a lot of time in the medical centre. Nauru te ami omanobik ottacharer moddhe jibon japon korechi ebong Nauru r obhiggota amake shompurno bodle deye amar jibon. Ami joto dur jani ami Nauru te manoshik bhabe ottacharer shikar hoyechi. Onno 25 theke 30 jon loker shonge amake ekta plastic er tabute rakha hoy. আমার জন্য একটা ছোট্ট বিছানা ছিল এবং সেখানে কোনো মানে প্যান বা পাখার ব্যবস্থা করা হয়নি যদিও নাউতে অত্যন্ত অত্যধিক গরম এবং আবহাওয়া আর্দ্র আমি এটা আমার জন্য ঘুমানোটা ছিল অত্যন্ত কষ্টকর সেখানে পয়নিষ্কাশন এবং পরিচ্ছন্নতার সুযোগ ছিল অত্যন্ত সীমিত আমি পান করার জন্য যথেষ্ট পরিমাণ পরিষ্কার পানি বা জীবাণু বা আপনার নিরাপদ পানি পাইনি এবং আমাকে অনেক সময় পানি দেওয়া হতো যেটা আসলে সঠিকভাবে বিশুদ্ধকরণ করা হয়নি আমাকে খাবার সংগ্রহ করার জন্য এমনকি ঘন্টার পর ঘন্টা লাইনে দাঁড়িয়ে থাকতে থাকতে হতো আমার ডিজেবিলিটির কারণে বা আমার শারীরিক প্রতিবন্ধকতার কারণে অনেক সময় আমার এমন হতো যে আমি লাইনে দাঁড়িয়ে থাকতে পারতাম না এবং এর ফলশ্রুতিতে আমি খাবার না নিয়ে আমাকে চলে আসতে হইতো নাউরুতে যখন আমি ছিলাম আমি প্রচুর সময় ব্যয় করেছি মেডিকেল সেন্টারে চিকিৎসার জন্য I provided to the Royal Commission a copy of some of the complaint letters I wrote to the Australian government about my treatment while on Nauru. Nauru te ami amake proti je byabohar kora hoyeche ba je chikitsa pradan kora hoyeche shei byapare ami onek obhijog Australia sarkarer kache pradan korechi. Ei obhijogular kichu kichu copy ami Royal Commission er kache pradan korechi. যাদের মধ্যে অস্ট্রেলিয়া সরকারের কাছে লেখা চিঠি আমার প্রতি যে ব্যবহার অমানবিক ব্যবহার করা হয়েছে নাউরুতে সেই সম্পর্কিত চিঠি কয়েকটা কপি আমি রয়্যাল কমিশনে জমা জমা দিয়েছি and related agencies to provide healthcare services to refugees and asylum seekers on Nauru while I was there. And I've provided copies of the letters and responses to the Royal Commission. International Health and Medical Services, IHMS. Tadir kichu kichu chithi ami shongro kito korechi. IHMS, Australia Shorkar, ebong tar shong sisho shongsta jara নাউরুতে থাকা রিফিউজি এবং অ্যাসালাম শিকারদেরকে চিকিৎসা সেবা প্রদান করে থাকে অথবা স্বাস্থ্যগত সেবা প্রদান করে থাকে তাদের একটা এরকম একটা সংস্থা যখন আমি নাউরুতে ছিলাম তারা আমাকে যে চিঠিগুলো দিয়েছিল সেই চিঠিগুলোর কয়েকটা সংরক্ষিত কপি আমি ইতিমধ্যে রয়্যাল কমিশনে জমা দিয়েছি এর বাইরে আপনি অতিরিক্ত কিছু বলতে চান এখানে বলতে চান আমি বলতে চাই যে মানুষ তো আমি জীবন বাঁচার জন্য জীবনকে অনেক ইয়া করার জন্য যে বাঁচার জন্য অস্ট্রেলিয়া আসছি তাই আমার জীবন লয়ে আমার অনেক দুর্গতি আমি অস্ট্রেলিয়াতে অস্ট্রেলিয়া 
once I arrived in Australia, the way I was treated was terrible. It was a terrible experience for me. I just would like to tell that it is unbearable or it was um, beyond imagination, the way I was treated once I was in Australia. I was transferred from Nauru to Australia in 2019 through the Medivac process, which allows people in offshore detention to be transferred to Australia for urgent medical treatment or further assessment. I was transferred to Australia for medical treatment after I was attacked by locals on Nauru and I sustained a broken leg. I understand that I was on the last Medicare, sorry, last Medivac flight out of Nauru. Um, I mean, Nauru took Australia to stand on to the Hoi Diazer Unishale, Medivac processor Madome, Jarmatome, uh, Australia, Bairetaka, uh, Astro Prati, among Rifigida, uh, Chikishar Projone, Australia, Mul Bukondi Asha Shudupai. I mean, uh, Australia the Chikisar Projan Ashi, uh Jokon Stanio Naurubashi, Luk Jon Amadur Akromon Kurichilo, Abong Amar Ayakromon for Lamar the Pab Hengi Chilo. Ekarone Chikisar Juno Amaki Australia Stan Tor Korahoi. Um Ami Amar Janamote, Ami Naruteke, Medibek Flight Asha, Sorboses, Sorboses Flight Asha, uh S Ami now Australia. Yes. Prior to being evacuated to Australia for medical treatment. I spent six months on Nauru, unable to walk properly and using a walking stick. I was offered medical treatment in Taiwan, but I'd heard negative feedback from other refugees about the medical treatment they had received there, so I didn't go. In Nauru, I was only given Panadol and occasional massages. Australia is a ছয় মাসের মতো সময় আমি ঠিকমতো হাঁটতে পারতাম না এবং আমি একটা লাঠিতে ভর করে হাঁটতাম এই সময়কালে আমাকে তাইওয়ানের চিকিৎসার জন্য পাঠানোর সুপারিশ করা হয়েছিল কি মা আমাকে অনুরোধ করা হয়েছিল যে আমি তাইওয়ানে যাই চিকিৎসার জন্য কিন্তু অন্যান্য রিফিউজিদের কাছ থেকে বা আশ্রয়প্রার্থীদের কাছ থেকে তাইওয়ান সম্পর্কে আমি ভালো অভিজ্ঞতা পাইনি সেজন্য আমি তাইওয়ানে যেতে চাইনি নাউরুতে থাকাকালে আমাকে শুধুমাত্র কিছু প্যানাডল দেওয়া হতো এবং মাঝে মাঝে কখনো কখনো আমাকে শারীরিক মেসেজ দেওয়া হতো ওকে আফটার আই আরাইভড ইন মেইনল্যান্ড অস্ট্রেলিয়া আই ওয়াজ ইনিশিয়ালি সেন্ট টু দ্য মেলবোর্ন ইমিগ্রেশন ট্রানজিট অ্যাকোমোডেশন এম আই টি এ হুইচ ইজ আ ডিটেনশন সেন্টার আই স্টেড এট এম আই টি এ ফর অ্যাপ্রক্সিমেটলি ওয়ান মান্থ আফটার হুইচ I was transferred to a mental health hotel. I was in the mental health ho- mental health hotel for about seven or eight months. I was then transferred to the Park Hotel in Melbourne. In total, I was in hotel detention for about 20 months. Australia Mool Bhukonde Ashar Por, Amake Potome Patanoichilo, Melbourne Immigration Transit Accommodation by MITA, Jetta Select Detention Center. আমি এমআইটি এতে প্রায় এক মাস ছিলাম তারপরে আমাকে একটা মেন্টাল হোল হেলথ হোটেলে স্থানান্তর করা হয় আমি মেন্টাল মেন্টাল হেলথ হোটেলে ছিলাম প্রায় 7 থেকে 8 মাস পরবর্তীতে আমাকে পার্ক হোটেল মেলবোর্নে স্থানান্তর করা হয় সব মিলিয়ে আমি হোটেল হোটেল ডিটেনশনে ছিলাম প্রায় 20 মাস কাল ওকে ইয়েস হোয়াইল আই ওয়াজ ইন হোটেল ডিটেনশন আই রিসিভ প্যানাডোল There was a doctor and nurse there, and towards the end of my stay, a physiotherapist would come about once a month, and that was the only disability support I received while I was in hotel detention. Hotel detention ne thaka kalle, ami panadol ketam. Ek jon doctor chilo, abong nurse chilo, abong e hotel detention ne thaka kar shesh dikhe ek jon physiotherapist amar kache ashto. মাসে একবার এবং শুধুমাত্র শারীরিক প্রতিবন্ধকতার এই একমাত্র চিকিৎসা আমি পেতাম এই হোটেল ডিটেনশনে থাকাকালে হোমলেসনেস আই ওয়াজ রিলিজ ফ্রম হোটেল ডিটেনশন 
and into the community in early 2021. I was provided with free accommodation for the first six months. And during this time, I was able, to, um, sorry, at this time I applied for and was able to access Centrelink. I received a payment of approximately $550 a fortnight. At Porvorti, I am our Abash, I am Grihohi Nota Shampoke, I am our Ubikota Boltechai. Hotel Detects on the Kamake, Mukti da Haibong, I am Australia, Jonas Homadiasi, the other Ekushale Shurudike. I am Protom Choyma Shamake, Binamule, Abasher, Abashon Babosta Korahai, Eshomakale. আমি আবেদন আমার আবেদনের প্রেক্ষিতে সেন্ট্রাল লিংক থেকে আমাকে কিছু ভাড়া প্রদান করা হতো আমি সব মিলিয়ে পক্ষকালে 550 ডলার বা প্রতি 14 দিনে প্রায় 550 ডলার মতো পেতাম ওকে আফটার अराउंड 6 মান্থস আই মুভড ইন টু আ শেয়ার হাউস ইন সাউথ ইস্টার্ন মেলবোর্ন হুইচ ইজ রান বাই আ কমিউনিটি অর্গানাইজেশন দ্যাট হেল্পস অ্যাসাইলাম সিকারস এন্ড রেফিউজিস I only stayed here for approximately two weeks. Chhoy mas sese, ami pray chhoy mas por, ami dukhin purbo Melbourne er ekti share house e ami sthanan tuito hoy, ortha ta ami onno deshonge room share kortam, house share kortam, abong she barita purjarona kor hoy to ekta jono shaba mulo potishtan theke, songsa theke, jara astro prakti abong refugee der shahajjo korto. Ami Ekane Pry or Shabile Dishop Term of Chilam. Around this time, I experienced some medical problems, including high blood pressure and an abnormal heartbeat. I was transferred by ambulance to hospital for treatment. I was in hospital for about two days. Eshomakale, Amar Kichu Shastagoto Somosha Purlokitohoi, Jarmo de Chilo Uchorokochap, among অস্বাভাবিক হৃদস্পন্দন আমি একবার অ্যাম্বুলেন্সে করে হাসপাতালে আমাকে স্থানান্তরিত করা হয়েছিল চিকিৎসার জন্য এবং আমি হাসপাতালে ছিলাম দুই দিনের মতো yes around this time my centrelink payments stopped when i was released from hospital i had no money and i could not afford accommodation or food although my visa gives me work rights i can't work because of my disability এই সময়ে আমার সেন্ট্রালিংক এর বা যে ভাতা সেটা বন্ধ হয়ে গিয়েছিল এবং আমি যখন হাসপাতাল থেকে ছাড়া পেলাম আমার কাছে কোনো টাকা ছিল না এবং আমি বাড়ি ভাড়া দিতে পারতাম না বাড়িতে থাকার জন্য ভাড়া দিতে পারতাম না অথবা আমি খাবার কিনতে পারতাম না সেই রকম টাকাও ছিল না যদিও আমার ভিসা আমাকে কাজের সুবিধা সুযোগ দিয়েছিল কিন্তু আমার শারীরিক বিকলাঙ্গতার কারণে বা প্রতিবন্ধকতার কারণে আমি আসলে কোনো কাজ করতে পারতাম না ওকে I was homeless for approximately two months during the COVID-19 lockdowns in Melbourne. Sometimes I would just lie down in the park or in the train to sleep. I had no money for food, so I found food in bins. Sometimes the police would question me and ask me to move on. I tried to avoid the police. I mean, COVID-19 lockdown to Melbourne for a সেই সময় দুই মাস কাল আমি গৃহহীন ছিলাম এবং আমি কখনো কখনো পার্কের বেঞ্চে শুয়ে থাকতাম অথবা আমি ট্রেনে ট্রেনে ঘুমাতাম আমার কোনো টাকা ছিল না খাবার খাবার কেনার জন্য এজন্য আমি বিনে বা ডাস্টবিনে খাবার খুঁজতাম অথবা আমি ওইখান থেকে খাবার সংগ্রহ করতাম কখনো কখনো পুলিশ আমাকে প্রশ্ন জিজ্ঞাসা করত এবং আমাকে চলে যেতে বলতো আমি পুলিশকে এড়িয়ে চলতে চাইতাম Yes. One day I was eating food out of a rubbish bin at a train station and there was an Indian cleaner who saw me and started talking to me because he felt sorry for me. He then helped me find a house with some Indian and Pakistani people in far western Melbourne and I've been living with them for about eight months. Uh, মানে রাবিশ বিন থেকে একটা কোন একটা ট্রেন স্টেশনে রাবিশ বিন থেকে খাবার সংগ্রহ করছিলাম একজন ইন্ডিয়ান বা ভারতীয় পরিচ্ছন্ন কর্মী আমাকে দেখতে পাইল এবং আমার সঙ্গে কথা বলা শুরু করলো এবং সে আমার জন্য দুঃখ বোধ করলো তারপরে সে আমাকে সাহায্য করলো একটা বাড়ি খুঁজে পেতে যেখানে কিছু ভারতীয় এবং পাকিস্তানি 
লোক বাস করত এবং সেটা ছিল পশ্চিম মেলবোর্নে আমি তাদের সঙ্গে প্রায় আট মাস কাল ছিলাম এই সময়ের যে অভিজ্ঞতা সেই সম্পর্কে আপনি কোনো কিছু যুক্ত করতে চান কিছু বলতে চান আমি বলতে চাই বলতে তো অনেক কিছু আসে কিন্তু ভোলার শেষ হবে না কিন্তু সিম্পলি বলতে চাই well i would like to tell you uh, something here if i tell my story it will take long 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 months or years my so many bitter experiences i had um i would like to keep all these things short to bolte chai amar je experience hoyche australia kono humanity nei e holo ekta keno ami by boat e australia aslam etai amar oporad আমি যেটা আমার অভিজ্ঞতা আমি জঙ্গলে যখন বিভিন্ন দেশে ছিলাম তার চেয়ে জঙ্গল আমি মনে করি যে নিরাপদ অস্ট্রেলিয়া আমার ডিটেনশন সেন্টার বাইরে আমার লাইফে কোনো নিরাপদ নাই মাই এক্সপিরিয়েন্স ইজ দ্যাট দি ওয়ার্ল্ড হিউম্যানিটি ইজ অ্যাবসেন্ট ইন অস্ট্রেলিয়া আই ওয়াজ বেটার ইন জাঙ্গল ইন ভেরি আদার কান্ট্রিজ মাই অনলি ফল ওয়াজ দ্যাট আই ওয়াজ আই অ্যারাইভড ইন অস্ট্রেলিয়া বাই বোর্ড uh that was my my that the only criminal activities i did and what the experience i uh, had because of that um that uh, fault is uh suggest that there is no word in uh, named humanity in australia okay ami ektai buji je eta ami ekjon প্রতিবন্ধী হিসাবে যে কোনো মানুষের সামনে দাঁড়াইলে তাদের চোখে আমাকে অনেক ধরনের কিছু দেখতে হয় যেটা নির্মস্তর যেটা আমি জানোয়ারের মতন এটাই আমি মনে করি তার জন্য আমার এই জীবনটা ওইভাবে বাসে নিতে হয়েছে হোয়াট আই ফিল লাইক ইন অস্ট্রেলিয়া ইজ দ্যাট ওয়েন পিপুল লুক এট মি বিং এ ডিজেবল পারসন এজ ইফ আই এম এন অ্যানিম্যাল দে লুক এট মি in a, in in a, in, a, in a way like that and i uh cursed my life because i was born as a disabled person tar pore amar aro obhiggoto je australia er immigration ekjon ya hisabe amake detention center rakhe jeta manushe ekta ye phabar jonno jeta anondo phabar jonno jeta মানুষ দেখতে প্রদর্শন করার জন্য যাই আনন্দ পাই তো এই জন্য আমাকে এই দশ বছর আমার লাইফ থেকে চিড়িয়াখানা হিসাবে ডিটেনশন সেন্টারে রাখা হয়েছে তাদের অন্যান্য লোকজনকে আনন্দ তাদের entertainment seeing our um, our bad bad uh, experience my feeling was like that can i can i continue yes can please i did not have any contact with the homelessness service or get free food from any organization whilst i was homeless i did see a doctor and received a covid-19 vaccination so that i could go into shopping centers and other public places and i also started seeing a mental health nurse around this time uh, homelessness service ba grihohin der jonno je seba tader kach theke ami ei shomoy kale kono rokom ki omoshonge jogajog kore nai ebong ami kono sanstar kach thekeo ami kono khabdo sahayata ki monno kono sahayata pai nai jokhon ami grihohin chilam ami ekjon doctor dekhe doctor er shonge dekha korechilam ebong ami covid 19 er vaccine ba tika peyechilam যেন আমি শপিং সেন্টারে যেতে পারি অথবা অন্যান্য জনসমক্ষে যেতে পারি 
এই সময়কালে আমি একজন মেন্টাল হেলথ নার্স বা মানসিক স্বাস্থ্যের যে সেবিকা তার সঙ্গে আমি দেখা করার সুযোগ পেয়েছিলাম My visa status. I am currently on a bridging E visa, class WE, bridging E general, subclass 050, which gives me work rights in Australia. I am not allowed to study. I have provided the Royal Commission with a letter from the Department of Home Affairs dated 11 July 2022 notifying me of the granting of my bridging visa. I received some assistance from a lawyer when I applied for this visa. Bortomane Amar Pisar Ovosta. Ami Bortomane Bridging E Visa Teati, Dar Class W E, Bridging Dob E, General, Subclass 050, Jar Karone Ami, Australia, Katskura, Utikar Pechi, Basuju Pechi, Judy Ami, Poroshuna Korosu Paini. এই সংক্রান্ত চিঠিটি আমি যেটা ডিপার্টমেন্ট অফ হোম অ্যাফেয়ার্স থেকে আমাকে প্রেরণ করা হয়েছে এগারোই জুলাই দুই হাজার বাইশ তারিখে মানে আমাকে যে বিচার দেওয়া হয়েছিল মঞ্জুরি করা হয়েছে সেইটার কপি আমি রয়্যাল কমিশনে জমা দিয়েছি আমি এই সময়কালে কিছু আইনগত আইনজীবীর কাছ থেকে আইনগত সুবিধা পেয়েছি যাতে আমি পেয়েছি যাতে আমি বিচারের জন্য আবেদন করতে পারি and have had their applications accepted by the United States. I have applied to the United States, but I think I have to provide them with more information. I'm not sure about the status of my application to the United States, and I don't have any lawyer helping me with it. I have no idea what will happen when my bridging visa expires in January 2023. <laughs> আমেরিকার যুক্তরাষ্ট্রে বিচার জন্য আবেদন করেছে এবং তাদের মধ্যে কেউ কেউ আমেরিকা যাওয়ার সুযোগ পেয়েছে তাদের আবেদন গৃহীত হয়েছে আমিও আমেরিকাতে যাওয়ার জন্য আবেদন করেছিলাম কিন্তু আমার মনে হয় তারা আরও কিছু অধিক তথ্য চায় আমার সম্পর্কে আমি আমার আবেদনের বর্তমান সর্বশেষ অবস্থা মানে আমেরিকাতে যাওয়ার আবেদনের সর্বশেষ অবস্থা সম্পর্কে অবগত নই এবং এই এই ব্যাপারে আমাকে সাহায্য করার জন্য কোনো আইনজীবী নাই জানুয়ারি দুই হাজার তেইশ সালে আমার ভিসার মেয়াদ বিজিং ভিসার মেয়াদ উত্তীর্ণ হবে পরবর্তীতে কি হবে আমার এই মুহূর্তে জানা নাই ফাউন্ডেশন হাউস সাপোর্ট I also have a case manager from a service provider, but I'm not really sure how they're meant to be helping me. I have to provide them with lots of information about my Centrelink payments, and I find this very stressful. Um, I'm not sure how to help you, but I'm not sure how to help you. I'm not sure how to help you, but I'm not sure how to help you. I'm not sure how to help you. ফাউন্ডেশন হাউসের লোকজন আমাকে সাহায্য করছে আমার একজন কেস ম্যানেজার আছেন যিনি আমাকে সেবা প্রদান করে থাকেন কিন্তু আমি আসলে ঠিক নিশ্চিত নই তারা কিভাবে আমাকে সাহায্য করছে আমাকে প্রচুর তথ্য দিতে হয় তাদেরকে যে আমি যাতে সেন্ট্রালিং পেমেন্টের ব্যাপারে এবং আমার কাছে এটা মনে হয় খুবই হয়রানিমূলক and talk to them about my problems. I often feel suicidal. I take antidepressant medication called Lexapro as well as medicine to help me sleep. Uh, foundation house manushik shabha pradhan kariya ek jane shongi aami niyomi to dhekha kori ebang aami aamar samashu bolo niya tarshongi a kotha boli. Aamar prai atto atto kori tichcha kore. Aami Lexapro namang kekti vishon nata virudhi oshod shabon kori jate aami I've been told I should see a mental health specialist, but as far as I know, I haven't seen one. I see a mental health nurse most weeks. I'm going to say that 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 I'
অধিকাংশ সপ্তাহে আমার সঙ্গে দেখা করে I was seeing an occupational therapist in OT earlier this year who tried a shower chair for me. The OT also taught me how to get in and out of bed and the best way to walk to relieve some of my back pain. I was exited from the service in May 2022. As an occupational therapist, I was able to get in and out of bed and the best way to relieve some of my back pain. I was exited from the service in May 2022. গোসল করতে পারি গোসলের চেয়ারটা ব্যবহার করতে পারি এছাড়া অকুপেশনাল থেরাপিস্ট আমাকে শিখিয়েছে কিভাবে আমার বিছানায় উঠতে হবে অথবা বিছানা থেকে নামতে হবে এবং কিভাবে আমি আমার পিঠের ব্যথা কমিয়ে একটু হাঁটার চেষ্টা করতে পারি এই জিনিসগুলা তিনি আমাকে হাতে কলমে শেখানোর চেষ্টা করেছেন কিন্তু এই সেবা থেকে আমি বেরিয়ে আসি দুই সালের মে মাসে I have to provide oh sorry I have been provided with access to medicare so I can see doctors for free however I have to pay for the medicine myself I also have to pay for massages which help to relieve some of my back pain I have to renew my medicare card every time my bridging visa expires which is every 3 to 6 months কিছুটা মুক্তি পাই সেগুলোর জন্য আমাকে নিজের ব্যবহার বহন করতে হয় আমার মেডিকেয়ার কার্ডটা আমার বিজিং মিশা মেয়াদ উত্তীর্ণের সঙ্গে সঙ্গে নতুন করে month. and i pay approximately 150 dollars a month towards bills i share a room with three other people about an hours drive from melbourne center ami proti 14 din por por ba pokkhokal por por central link theke 550 dollar er moto pai kintu khabar kinar por bari bhara dewar por ebong sharirik je message seta newar por amar pither jonno je message ami nei আমার কাছে আসলো কিছুই থাকে না আমি বাড়ি ভাড়া দেই প্রতি মাসে ছয়শো ডলার এবং আমি একশো পঞ্চাশ ডলারের মতো বিল দিতে হয় আমাকে প্রতি মাসে অন্য তিনজন লোকের সঙ্গে আমি একটা রুম শেয়ার করি মেলবোর্ন এর কেন্দ্র থেকে যেটা প্রায় এক ঘন্টার দূরত্ব They are on the similar visa to me, which also allows them to work. They are all working in the community doing factory or retail jobs. They are living a relatively normal life, saving money, and some have even bought a car. Nauru te thaka kale onna no je bondi jara chilo, tada shongi amar Facebook e joga jokha hai. Tara wa amar mutu i prai eki rakom pisa pe chhe. যার ফলে তারা কাজের অধিকার পেয়েছে তারা অস্ট্রেলিয়ার জন্য সমাজে কাজ করছে তাদের কেউ কেউ ফ্যাক্টরিতে অথবা রিটেল জবে আছে তারা পারত পক্ষে মানে আমার তুলনামূলকভাবে একটা স্বাভাবিক জীবনযাপন করছে এবং তারা কিছু টাকা জমা করতে পারছে তাদের মধ্যে কেউ কেউ এমনকি গাড়িও কিনেছে I can't do anything to improve my situation. I find this very depressing. I'm also required to have a review of my Centrelink payment every three months, which I find stressful and depressing. Feels very suffocating. I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm not going to be able to do this. মানে ক্লান্তি বোধ করি কিংবা মানসিক ভাবে বিপর্যস্ত বোধ করি প্রত্যেক তিন মাস পর পর আমার সেন্ট্রাল লিঙ্কের যে পেমেন্ট এটার পর্যালোচনা করা হয় এবং এটা আমার জন্য অত্যন্ত মানসিক কষ্টদায়ক একটা বিষয় আমি এমন কি আমার দমবন্ধ হয়ে আসে এটার কথা মনে পড়লে 
I do not sleep at night. I usually sleep in the morning and wake up at about 2 p.m. After I wake up, I pray and have some food. I usually go to the medical or uh, any other appointments in the afternoon. I am a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a আমি সাধারণত স্বাস্থ্য অথবা অন্যান্য অ্যাপয়েন্টমেন্টে অংশগ্রহণ করি বিকাল বেলা ইয়েস আই সি এ ফিজিওথেরাপিস্ট এ ম্যাসাজ থেরাপিস্ট এন্ড এ মেন্টাল হেলথ নার্স ওয়ান্স আ উইক আই অলসো হ্যাভ মাই অ্যাপয়েন্টমেন্ট এট ফাউন্ডেশন হাউস ওয়ান্স আ উইক ফর কাউন্সেলিং এন্ড আই গো টু দ্য মস্ক টু প্রে ইচ ফ্রাইডে একজন ফিজিওথেরাপিস্ট একজন ম্যাসাজ থেরাপিস্ট এবং একজন মানসিক স্বাস্থ্য বিষয়ক সেবিকা সঙ্গে আমি দেখা করি প্রতি সপ্তাহে একবার এছাড়া ফাউন্ডেশন হাউসে আমার অ্যাপয়েন্টমেন্ট থাকে সপ্তাহে একদিন কিছু উপদেশ নেওয়ার জন্য আমি এছাড়া শুক প্রতি শুক্রবারে আমি মসজিদে যাই নামাজ পড়তে আইম ভেরি ওয়ারিড অ্যাবাউট মাই ফিউচার আই হোপ দ্যাট আই ক্যান ফাইন্ড আ পার্মানেন্ট প্লেস টু লিভ আই জাস্ট ওয়ান্ট টু লিভ আফ উইদাউট হ্যারাসমেন্ট and to be treated with respect and dignity ami amar bhobishyot niye ottonto udbigno ami asha kori je ami shudhu ekta jibon japon korar jonno ekta nirapod jaygay jonno khuje pai ami shudhu matro hairani chhara ekta shabhabik jibon japon korte chai ebong ami somman ebong mordodar shonge baste chai yes mr raman thank you for sharing only a small part of your story with the royal commission Thank you everyone for listening my history. You know, my history is very big. That's 10 years. I have experienced this detention center. This is very hard for me. I can explain for you, everybody. This is no, this Australia detention, this is in the hanging. This Australia detention center no have humanity. Humanity, Australia have also in the internet everybody actually selling news the humanity country humanity people same like this this uh, mother and sister they like that uh, our family they like that's uh, this government 10 years my life killing that's hanging so many time i requesting please over over i am tired this is i am no other people this the strong man i am in the disability can please help for me can live i live in the hanging in the detention center for me also i suicide most of the time this time the security wilson security immigration this is no listening anybody this is our boys in the cook it in the toilet same like the cook in the dustbin thus i ask in everybody i need come out my life in the give in the future i didn't know see in the future dark i also applied to us i lived in the australia live in australia no have humanity killing in the life thus i need to you are helping everybody please can do that for me i pray everyone this is for me this life i need that's better also my breathing i can my mind come in my breathing stop i come in the detention center in the community i feeling that i can no community i am same this a detention center after my breathing now no can uh, come up oh bit time my breathing in the stop sometime i go in the foundation now sometime i go doctor ne- never see in the my breathing come up i need you are guys everybody that's help for me i can need in the my breathing stop there's a come out the feeling better life that is my request i request every body i need this other government we, uh, 
government, I need to see my history in the government. Uh, why is my fault? Why I, I, I not criminal? Why my 10 years, my life killing can feedback and my answer I need to Australia government. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mr. Rahman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rahman. Um, I'll ask my colleagues if they have any questions for you. Commissioner McEwen. I don't have any questions, but I do want to say a tremendous thank you for your bravery to come and share your stories with us and your experiences. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Bernard. Uh, no, but I also um, share Commissioner McEwen's words. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Rahman. I too uh, thank you for uh, sharing your experiences with us in your uh, written statement and in your evidence today. Uh, we're very grateful to you for uh, being prepared to uh, tell us of your experiences. So thank you very much. <laughs> गवर्नमेंट মানে আমার জীবনের যে অত্যাচার করেছে 10 বছর পর্যন্ত আগের যে गवर्नमेंट আর অখনকার गवर्नमेंट তা বোঝা যাবে যে কোন জন কতটুকু হার্ড আছে কার কতটুকু হার্ড আছে তার জন্য আমি একটু রিকোয়েস্ট লাস্ট আমারে এটা থ্যাঙ্ক ইউ ভেরি মাচ টু অল ফর হিয়ারিং মাই মাই স্টোরিজ আই উড লাইক টু টেল ইউ গাইস অ্যাজ ইউ হ্যাভ হার্ড অ্যাবাউট মাই জার্নি মাই স্টোরি if possible you just let the government know about my experiences and i believe that the previous government and present government will make the difference actually um, making a secure place for me so that i can lead a, um, a, a decent um, normal human life in australia in future yes um, i seek your advice and support in that case in that thank you i think i think we understand uh, your uh, position uh, mr Raman, and uh, we thank you again for the evidence you have given. Thank you. Um, Commissioners, can we take a, a morning tea adjournment for yes, thank you. 15 to 20 minutes? Thank you. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is resumed. Yes, Ms. Eason. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. Our next witness is Carly Scholar from Foundation House, and you'll see she's here in the hearing room with us. I hope you're not too cold. It's freezing in there. <laughs> Let us know. <laughs> Fine, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for coming to the Commission. Thank you for your statement, which we have. Okay. We also have uh, the documents uh, prepared by the Foundation, uh, and uh, if uh, those of us who uh, have not read them yet will read them, some have. Uh, so thank you for uh, assisting us. And I shall now ask you please to take the oath and if you would be good enough uh, to follow the instructions of my associate who's located in the corner over there, she will give you the instructions. I will read you the oath. At the end, please say yes or I do. Do you swear by almighty God that the evidence which you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you very much. I'll now ask Ms Eastman to ask you some questions. Just to confirm you, Carly Scholar. 
Yes. And you're the General Manager Direct Services at the Victorian Foundation for Survivors of Torture, known as Foundation House. Correct. You've prepared a statement for the Royal Commission dated 24 October 2022. Yes. And we've got one typographical error to address. Commissioners, uh, you'll find this at paragraph 68 on page 19. The last line of that paragraph, in the at last line um, of that paragraph, the word by should be my. Thank you very much for that important correction. With that amendment, it is the uh, statement true and correct? It is. All right. And thank you very much for providing the statement. Uh, what I thought we might do is start by just um, asking a little bit about yourself, and then I want to ask you about Foundation House. And then from there, I, uh, I'm keen to, to ask you about how Foundation House approaches trauma-focused and trauma-informed practices, and then we'll turn to some of the specific issues and examples that you've provided in the statement. So you've also, I think, provided to us a copy of your CV and your qualifications tell us that you are a, a, a qualified psychologist and your background indicates that your particular area of expertise has been in relation to children and adolescents. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And in terms of your current role as the General Manager of Direct Services, You've set that out at paragraph four and also 14 and 15 of your statement. But what can you tell us about your role at Foundation House? Sure. So my role is, as General Manager Direct Services, is to really oversee the delivery of quality services across the client services stream of Foundation House, which includes the metropolitan I'm areas. I'm going to have to ask you to slow down. Of course. <laughs> and maybe uh, I'll just check that the volume is fine with the team in the room, that everybody can hear you. Thank you. All good. Uh, so that includes uh, quality service delivery across the metropolitan areas and also in partnership with some services across rural and regional Victoria as well. Now, Foundation House, it's a not-for-profit organisation. Yes. It's based in Melbourne and it was founded in 1987. That's correct. And its vision is a world without torture where communities respect, embrace and empower people from refugee backgrounds to thrive. So Foundation House uh, operates across Victoria, is that right? Yes, that's, that's correct. Foundation House operates uh, predominantly across metropolitan Melbourne, but we're responsible for clients across Victoria in partnerships, in partnership with organisations across rural and regional Victoria. So we subcontract those services to them, but we provide them with professional development, supervision and training and so on. So you have about 200 staff, is that right? Yes, over 200 staff. And I just want to ask you about the five locations where you predominantly work, Brunswick, Dallas, Dandenong, Ringwood and Sunshine. Correct. Now, for some of us, particularly those in Victoria, they will know those areas, but others may not. Is there anything particular about those locations and why Foundation House operates in these particular areas? Yes, so we have... Those are our regional offices and they're located really in those areas because they're, uh, they're closest to the, the to communities that we support. So those areas have high refugee settlement or at least are as close as we can practically get to communities of high refugee settlement, which is why we're located in those areas. And there is approximately 4,000 refugees who have settled in, who settle in Victoria each year through the humanitarian program. Yes. Uh, again, for uh, people who may not uh, be familiar with the pathways to be recognised as a refugee and settling in Australia, when you're talking about the humanitarian program, what are you uh, speaking to there? So the humanitarian program primarily refers to people who are granted refugee visas offshore through the humanitarian program, and so they're they're identified offshore and they're brought into Australia as part of what's called the humanitarian intake of refugees. And the humanitarian program is a program fixed by government that might identify a particular number for intake on the humanitarian program on yeah. an annual basis. Yeah. I don't want to oversimplify that, but is that a fair description? Yes, there's, usually, there's, a, there's a cap on those 
places, and that's that's how many people we, uh, the gov you know the government kind of allows into the country on that basis. And in terms of the four thousand refugees who settle in Victoria each year, is there any uh, particular sort of characteristics in terms of a cohort coming from a particular part of the world or? from particular conflict zones? Is there anything um, about the nature of the 4,000 refugees who settle in Victoria under that program? Look, that really that really varies over time. So over the years, that really varies according to uh, what's happening in the world. It, it really varies according to the global conflicts and uh, issues that are arising. And so over the decades, that has changed markedly. Uh, that's all outlined in our annual report. We keep track of the communities we serve. Um, you know, at present, there's there's a high number, for example, from Afghanistan. We're seeing new arrivals from from Ukraine. Uh, we we often have high numbers from Iraq, from Syria, from Afghanistan, from Burma, Myanmar. There's there's a number of places, and it's very diverse. We see we see clients from well over 40, 40 nations across the world. Uh, in addition to the refugees who come through the humanitarian program, there are also about 10,000 asylum seekers who are living in Victoria as they await a decision on their protection visa applications. So in terms of that cohort of 10,000, what can you tell us about the nature of the asylum seekers and when you're talking about their protection visas, uh, what are the, the circumstances for that group? So the circumstances of that group was really touchingly and compellingly highlighted by Mr Rahman, who spoke earlier. So many of them arrived, uh, you know, 2012, 2013, or prior to that time, and many have been in limbo ever since in terms of uh, their status. So often they arrived uh, by boat in very traumatic circumstances they have often spent years in detention centres and it has taken a very very long time for their refugee status to be determined and even when um, it has been determined that that Australia does um, you know have has got responsibilities towards them in terms of their refugee status and that's been determined uh, there are significant difficulties with them them being resettled and Mr Rahman really um, you know touched on that. Okay. And I so think you, a high degree of high degree of uncertainty mm -hmm. in terms of their lives and rebuilding those lives, and also a high degree of complexity in terms of the rights that they have and that they don't have. That's really not understood by most of the community. So against that that background of the refugees and asylum seekers who Foundation House works with and supports. Mm -hmm. A sort of three areas in terms of Foundation House's work, is that right? Yes, client, that's correct. Client services, community capacity building and practice and sector development. Can I ask you just to briefly outline with respect to each of those areas what Foundation House does? So can yes. we start with client services? Sure. So client services include counselling at the individual, group and family levels, client advocacy, and community-based psychoeducation, as well as group therapeutic interventions. And we also host a bulk billing mental health clinic on our premises with, with bulk billing psychiatry predominantly. Community capacity building is really around working with communities at a grassroots level to build their capacity to identify and respond to the needs of vulnerable persons in their community and support their recovery and also to work with services to try and understand the barriers that people experience as well. And then practice and sector development. Uh, we're committed to supporting the health, education, employment and community sectors to understand the impacts of trauma and provide responsive services to the needs of people whom we serve. And so to that end, we provide organisational consultancy, we provide training, we provide professional development and supervision to really try and build the capacity of the service system to respond in ways that are more effective. And how is um, Foundation House funded to deliver these services and to undertake all of this work? So we're, we're funded from both Commonwealth and state government with a small amount of philanthropic funding as, as well and some, and some private donations. And just tell us a little bit about the profile of people who work at Foundation House. Do you have a mixture of... Uh, clinicians, uh, uh, yes, social so we, workers? 
Yes, so in terms of the client services, uh, our model is that we have a counsellor advocate model. So, so they might be um, people of many different back backgrounds, social work, psychology, counselling, those kind of backgrounds who are trained and skilled in therapeutic interventions. And we call it a counsellor advocate role because what's also required is that advocacy work across the, across the sector um, to enable those barriers to access to all sorts of services to, um, to help with those things. And also because we recognise that providing just, we can have a highly skilled therapeutic intervention that's highly evidence-based. And if someone is, is living in their car or with absolute uncertainty in their lives, that's going to be completely ineffective, that we need to assist with those elements as well. Otherwise, the service is basically useless. Just, and I do want to get to the trauma issues, but just on this issue of advocacy, over the last uh, few days, the Royal Commission has heard about the importance of advocacy, both in terms of self-advocacy, then community advocacy, and then the more systemic advocacy in terms of uh, perhaps lobbying for change. In terms of self-advocacy for the cohort of refugees and asylum seekers, uh, do you have any observations about how self-advocacy can be supported in the model that Foundation House uses with the clients? Uh, yes. So there, there are a number of, I guess, assumptions made when we think about self-advocacy, that people are able to self-advocate, and it is um, certainly an excellent ideal, but, but in practice it's often not feasible for, for people from refugee um, backgrounds when there's overlays of being culturally and linguistically diverse plus trauma plus dislocation plus language and cultural barriers and so often it is which is fantastic but but systemically it often is not and so one thing that we do is work with communities so we have a whole system of community advisory groups that we use and a really well developed system for recruiting people to those groups and seeking their advice and input, providing training and support. So that's very genuinely uh, input from community. And there's documents that we've, that we've provided that highlight some of that approach and some of the information that's able to be, you know, garnered through that, through that approach. I want to turn to the issue of trauma. And it's not uncommon these days to hear people talk about a trauma-informed approach. Mm. There's also a trauma-focused approach. It's right, isn't it, that these approaches to understanding trauma very much arose by looking at the experience of people who have been survivors of conflict, mm -hmm. survivors of torture, and survivors of very extreme, extreme violence. And services like Foundation House and other services supporting refugees were developing trauma-focused practice 30 years ago. Is that a fair Correct. assumption? Yes. And for a long time, the discussion around trauma-informed approaches was very much focused on supporting people who were victims of torture or very significant human rights abuses. Yes. In more contemporary times, we're using trauma-informed approaches to describe a much larger cohort of people who may have experienced violence, abuse, neglect or exploitation. Is that right? Uh, yes. So let's go back to the sort of foundations of a, a trauma-informed approach and trauma practice. I think the starting point is to understand that trauma is not just an isolated single critical incident. Mm -hmm. That can be an incident of trauma, but the trauma we're focusing on is much mm -hmm. more complex forms of trauma. Is that right? Yes. So, so in terms of the way that we understand the traumatic events that we would refer to at, at Foundation House, um, they're really events that, are, that, that pose a serious and major threat to a person's life or self. They include exposure to actual threat and death, serious injury, losses in violent circumstances or witnessing such events. Um, so, so in terms of our client cohort and the communities who have this background, 
the, the pre-arrival experiences um, really are characterised by exposure to, to, to very severe violence and loss, uh, perpetration of human rights violations, forced displacement, um, and also usually extreme hardship over many years that is cumulative. And um, what we, what we, I mean, the impacts of those are enormous, and I can go into those in a minute, but um, there is emerging literature around that being complex trauma. So there's single incident trauma, which is, all, all trauma is, of course, by its nature, uh, very significant. Um, and complex trauma is, is recognised um, as, as really being very profound in its impact, um, Refugee-related trauma is repeated, it's prolonged, it's severe, it's interpersonal in nature, and usually many domains of functioning are affected. So attachment issues, relationships, our sense of uh, our ability to modulate our emotions, our social skills, cognitive skills, identity formation. Um, and it's really recognised that that has enormous fragmenting impact on our lives without protective factors in play and without capacity for recovery. There's some of this link in with the diagnostic approach. So if we look at the DSM-4 or DSM-5 now and look at the diagnostic criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder, some of the um, characteristics that would allow a diagnosis of PTSD reflect the, the yes. matters that you've referred to. Yeah. So it's got it on one level, it can be seen as a psychiatric illness or condition, but you're looking at a response to trauma, not through a clinical or psychiatric lens, but as the experience of the person coming to Australia. Yes, yeah, right? I guess we can think of traumatic events you know, and those are the events that, that occur. And then we can think about how people respond to those things and then what the impact is of, of, of that response that happens. And um, not always, but, but often that can lead to significant challenges then with mental health. It may lead to diagnosis of PTSD, depression, uh, pretty disabling anxiety and so on. Um, but there are, there are huge opportunities for recovery with the right supports and, and things in place. And for children and young people who uh, may experience trauma themselves but also be quite young when their parents have been in circumstances of experience of trauma, what is the impact on children and young people in the course of their life? So for children and young people, it's complex because there's, um, there's, the, there's, there's the impact on the family, there's the impact on their parents, um, which has a huge impact then on the, the parents trying to protect them. Uh, that's if there's usually family dislocation, there's usually family loss as well. And so the impact for children is on their development, on their sense of identity. Of course, if they come to Australia, they need to learn the language and um, a trauma manifests in all sorts of ways intergenerationally as well as um, parents, families, communities do their best to protect one another and protect their children. But the impact of those traumatic events is enormous and uh, issues like shame and guilt and feeling responsible really can get in the way of some of those protective factors that parents offer their children as well. And do you see that sort of manifest in intergenerational trauma across can, families yes. and over a long period of time? I want to ask you about trauma-informed uh, care, and you've said in the statement that relates to the systems and services, understanding the nature, severity, psychosocial consequences generated by the trauma history of asylum seekers and refugees. And part of this is using that knowledge to then in turn determine the best support for individuals, families and the community where the impact occurs. Yeah. Can you explain that in a little more detail sure. for us, please? Sure. So the concept of, and I've heard it in these, in these hearings, you know, today and yesterday and across other places, and it was certainly a big feature of the Victorian Mental Health World Commission as well, this concept of trauma-informed care. Um, being trauma-informed is very easy to put on paper. It's just like two, two words with a, with a dash. Um, and it's, it really makes an enormous difference if a service is genuinely trauma-informed. And it actually takes a lot of work to, to do that. So it needs to be much more than words on a page. 
the principles are around really trying to understand a person. So not, not thinking what's wrong with you, but thinking what are the things that have happened in your life that are impacting now. It involves services uh, really looking at in, increasing and enhancing the physical safety and the emotional psychological safety with which they offer people who are accessing those services really focusing on increasing trust. Without trust, you're going to get nowhere with any of the services. They're completely ineffective without that development of trust. And traumatic exposure to traumatic events acts to, to really um, destroy trust. So trust is key. Increasing choice and control. So that, that um, impacts on all sorts of what people might think are little things that are really not little, like gender of interpreter, like having the appropriate interpreter that's preferred where someone feels safe. So enhancing choice, agency and control is critical. Being collaborative with people is critical and enhancing dignity and respect. So all of those principles are part of being genuinely trauma-informed. And if you think about what's required in a service system, you need to put those into all the procedures and policies. And it means that services need to make decisions with those things in mind. So it's, it really takes an organisational wide, very conscious approach to do that in practice, but it's absolutely possible. In, in practice, does that mean uh, that any person who may engage, and I know our focus is asylum seekers and refugees for present purposes, needs to understand, not just saying a trauma-informed approach, but actually practicing an approach? Yes, it's how do critical. You, how do you do that? So, so some people it, might be on yeah. the front counter or on the end yeah. of a phone. How do we... How do we actually so, develop those yeah. practices? So we do it by providing training to every single person in the organisation, not just frontline clinical, social work, counsellor advocate roles, around being trauma-informed and around our trauma recovery framework and the impact. So it's as, it's as um, simple and as complex, if you like. If someone comes into Foundation House to main reception and they're incredibly distressed or agitated, the first response won't be a fear response or a controlling response or... Um, an annoyed response, it would be a supportive response, assuming something is happening for this person. This has come from somewhere. They might be being triggered. They might be having a really distressing episode. They might be having flashbacks right there and then. And so the approach right then is one of listening. It's one of respect. It's one of treating that person with dignity and kind of making that assumption in the moment. There is a reason for this person to behave the way that they are behaving. And in all likelihood, that is coming out of some kind of difficulty or some kind of trauma response. And if services are set up like this and really prioritise this, it's not only the refugee and asylum seeker cohort who are going to benefit. They're all, I mean, throughout Australian life, um, there'll be people with disabilities who have experienced trauma. And if we get this right, we can get it right for refugees and asylum seekers, but we can also massively improve it for everyone else who's experienced really difficult traumatic events in their life. So by doing this, it's not, it's not this one little cohort, I guess, that we'd be assisting, but it would be all people with disability. You mentioned uh, the framework and you referred in the statement, and I think the commissioners have uh, a copy of the integrated trauma recovery service model or the yep. framework. There's four recovery goals in that. Can I ask you to explain briefly to the commissioner how that how the commissioners how that model works and what the four recovery goals mean and how uh, and we I'll stop there and we might talk about some examples of it applying in practice sure and I'm happy I realize that the that the actual framework that we use is certainly embedded in that in that document but I'm happy to provide it as a separate one because it, it makes it a bit simpler as well so our four recovery goals come out of really understanding the work and the experience that clients and communities have told us over the, over the last 30 years or so. And so, for example, if someone's experienced, um, you know, killings, serious injuries, threats to self and others, forced disappearances, that may well lead to chronic fear, to helplessness, to loss of agency and control, to anxiety, to avoidance, to hypersensitivity to threat and injustice, and that's where one of our key recovery goals around restoring safety, enhancing agency and control comes from. Um, you know, another common thing that can happen in terms of the experiences of our clients and communities um, in terms of persecution and human rights violations are death or separation from loved ones, imposed isolation, forced displacement, 
And so that creates bonds and attachments within families and communities. And so that's where our second recovery goal around restoring secure attachments, connections to other people and sense of belonging. That's why it's rooted there. Um, you know, thirdly, people have often experienced human rights violations on a mass, mass scale. Um, and it really can destroy one's core beliefs about just human nature and what the world should be like and what the universe offers. And um, it really um, brings a loss of trust and a questioning of meaning and identity. And that's where our third recovery goal comes from, which is around restoring trust, meaning, purpose to life, identity and justice. So our, our services are not, are not just like focused on, you know, the, the therapeutic kind of thing in the moment, it's a much, it's much bigger than that. Um, fourthly, what is really common in uh, situations that our, our clients have come from in terms of refugee related trauma is transgression of sacrosanct boundaries, um, impossible choices, you know, rape as a weapon of war, for example. And so the guilt and the shame and the blame that comes from that are really very extreme. And that's where our fourth recovery goal, which is around restoring dignity and value reducing excessive shame and guilt comes from. And uh, in terms of these, that framework, would it be fair to say that that's not a framework that we commonly see in government agencies or in service providers? And does that uh, result in a lack of understanding perhaps in those systems about the long-term impact of trauma and how it manifests in people's yes. lives if, if left unacknowledged or untreated. Yeah, I think it can be massively understated. And people, I guess, assume that a traumatic event happens, someone experiences trauma, and then there's a reaction straight away. And this can, this can stay under the surface for years and years and years. It might be that they need acute services right now. It might be that this bubbles up in a decade or in you know, two decades or even three decades uh, once they're out of survival mode. Trauma survivors are very susceptible to how they may be treated and how mm. uh, another person or a government agency reacts or responds to them. Is that right? Yes, that's true. What is important for trauma survivors in terms of how they're treated? So it's incredibly important for trauma survivors that they're treated with respect and with dignity. Um, and that there's an understanding of what may have occurred in these scenarios. We have some case studies there if you'd like me to go to those. Yes, I will. And you've also, I think, mentioned the importance of being believed yes. and that sense for a trauma survivor. Uh, if they engage with a service provider, government, and they have a sense that they're not being believed, that goes to the trust issue, doesn't it? But it, it goes more. Yeah, it really goes to the trust issue and also... Um, they're not going to disclose if they're not going to be believed. And I, and I listened to some of the testimony from yesterday, for example, uh, where I think someone was saying that a kind of a standard psychology or counselling kind of approach was, was not useful. And I'm not surprised because um, uh, many people would not even have in their mind the kinds of trauma that might have been experienced. And um, the person on the other side of the seat might is that they, they can't disclose all of that. They don't think the person who's listening to them can handle it. But they're not going to handle um, the, the kind of extreme thing, nature of things that have happened to them. And so trust um, needs to be built. And also a, the sense of emotional safety, like someone really uh, gets to understand whether the person who's supposedly listening to them and assisting them can really handle what they have to say or not. Now, uh, there are some examples, mm -hmm. and I'll just give everybody listening a warning that some people may find some of these examples confronting. Mm -hmm. But we did ask Foundation House to share some examples so that we have a better understanding about mm -hmm. the impact of trauma mm -hmm. or people from called backgrounds, particularly refugees and asylum seekers, mm -hmm. in accessing what we might call the mainstream service system. Yeah. So do you, I think our yes. commission is up to paragraph 30, if yeah. it helps to follow along. Yeah. Over to you. So, so we can give an example of a trauma survivor who was admitted to a public mental health facility and treated for an eating disorder. She refused to eat to the level that she was close to dying. It became evident through our work that she didn't have an eating disorder. She was a torture survivor who'd been forced to eat truly horrific things as part of her torture in her country of origin. 
And so without that understanding, uh, the, the, the impact of the mental health treatment was actually making, I would say, would be making things worse, not better, um, because that wasn't understood. People, people may or may not know that the classic um, evidence-based treatment for eating disorders, for example, is that one must make the person eat. Um, now, if we think about a trauma survivor who's been forced to eat impossible things, that's going to be the opposite of, of what's needed. So without that understanding and that gentle, sensitive inquiry, uh, the, the treatment can be completely ineffective and counterproductive and do harm. Uh, another example was a student who was referred to mental health services by school because he was showing depressive symptoms. The history wasn't initially taken and he was treated for depression. It was later discovered that he had lost both parents and witnessed his mother, when I say lost, they, they died, and witnessed his mother killed by a bomb. And as a result, he developed post-traumatic stress disorder, among other problems. Now, without really diligent work to identify that history and assess it, um, using that trauma-informed lens, those issues would have been would have been missed. And there was no way this young this, this young adolescent boy could recover from his depression without acknowledgement that his parents had died and he had witnessed that. So a third example would be someone who presented with severe postnatal depression and was being treated in the mental health system, but without significant progress. And when she became a client of Foundation House, it was learned that the woman experienced her baby dying in her arms during a bomb blast. Now, because of our involvement, and again, the trauma-focused treatment and the trauma-informed lens, she was then well supported through her next pregnancy and birth, and there was a focus on the attachment and the connection with her children as well as her own trauma. And so that attention not only helped her recover from that trauma, but also helped her attachment and her connection with her young children, potentially, um, you, know, you know, decreasing the risk of them uh, also then having mental health issues and development and attachment issues later in their lives. So um, Foundation House has uh, undertaken a study in relation to young people from refugee backgrounds using mental health services. And uh, a number of issues I think have arisen mm. in the course of that study to highlight those issues around the impact of trauma on young people. Do you want to speak to that? Uh, yes. So um, some of the things that those young people identified um, was that, uh, for example, they found it difficult to implement advice sometimes by practitioners, good evidence-based advice such as relaxation, uh, if they were worried about the safety of their family members overseas who couldn't eat and were in hiding. Um, that unless the practitioners were aware of what was happening in their issues, in their, in their countries of origin and inquired about that, that their advice and their treatment was, was not effective. Um, Um, yeah, and we would also say that services need to be really respectful and understanding of the cultural responsiveness required and the cultural safety, and that's been spoken to really well so far already in these hearings, um, and being really conscious of the explanatory models that we use and that we're open to and that really any of those encounters can be cross-cultural and that we need to bring kind of cultural humility to those so I think we asked you, based on uh, the clients who you've supported and the research that Foundation House has undertaken, to uh, assist the Royal Commission in understanding the barriers mm -hmm. to accessing and seeking treatment for mental health issues. Because it might be suggested that uh, trauma recovery requires support mm -hmm. and a person has to be prepared to access the support. Yes. So it may be this sense of, well, the support's here. You can uh, approach these services and away we go and we'll be able to fix you. The, ba the barriers are quite significant, aren't yes. they? Yes, right. so yeah, the there's significant thing, barriers. The first so, barrier is stigma, isn't it? So what yes. can you tell us about that? Uh, so stigma is a very significant uh, barrier. It's a, it's a barrier across the, across you know, Australian community anyway, but it's certainly... Uh, significantly more, I would say, in culturally linguistically diverse communities, in particular from refugee backgrounds. Um, re our research and community cons consultation showed us that people from refugee backgrounds were often reluctant to approach services if they use mental health in their title or in the way that they described uh, their work. 
Similarly, families often didn't want children to use mental health services uh, because of that sense of stigma, because of a sense of shame, because the parents assumed it must be their fault, what was happening for their, for their children. And in fact, one of the studies showed that um, based on parent surveys that children with non-English speaking background, parents were less likely, the children were least likely to access mental health services, for instance. Um, for humanitarian entrants arriving in Australia with permanent residency, they're often reluctant to disclose their mental health issues for fear that immigration authorities would use those against them. And so that's, that's a very significant barrier for them. And similarly, uh, often asylum seekers are very unwilling and, and, and very hesitant to identify and disclose that uh, because they're worried that it would put their visa status and applications at risk. Some people uh, have a great fear of uh, health professionals because it may well have been that health professionals had been uh, part of the reason why torture or persecution yeah. has occurred. Yeah, yeah how, there's often. How do we navigate that? It's really situation? hard. Sometimes uh, professionals, including doctors, mental health professionals, others in government, have have been part of the torture and trauma experience. And so significant time is needed to build up the trust. And at Foundation House, we've made quite a significant effort in our, just in our environment. It's a very non-clinical, it's a very non-clinical space. Can I ask you now about the barriers for uh, refugees and asylum seekers accessing disability services? Mm -hmm. So for a refugee or asylum seeker who may be a person with lived experience of disability, they may have an intellectual disability, acquired brain injury, developmental disorder, or quite significant physical or mobility mm. disability. Mm. What are the barriers for, uh, for them to access disability services in Australia? Yeah. So in terms of um, accessing disability uh, services, often uh, all the co-occurring diagnosis and so on can be missed. So even where, and this is where that intersectional lens that has been raised before in this in these hearings is really is really important. So um, that even where some a presentation might be recognised, for example, as coming out of trauma, that doesn't mean that trauma is the only thing going on here. Uh, that doesn't mean there might not be other things also at play, and then they're often missed. So we have an, an example there. Shall I explain yes. that? So, uh, you know, we've got an example um, that we can talk to. A mum, I'll call her Maria, and her adult children arrived in Australia after living in a refugee camp for many years. And one of the children had experienced a traumatic sexual assault in the refugee camp. And he presented with significant, I'll call him John, significant mental health issues, including nightmares, which made him fearful. He would leave the house, wander in the neighbourhood, and he was angry and aggressive towards other family members and everyone found it very stressful. They weren't getting adequate support for this and this close family really was fragmenting. Um, he was assessed by various health services. He was diagnosed with PTSD, he was prescribed medication, family moved to Melbourne and his behaviour deteriorated even further. He wasn't able to be left alone at this stage. When they came to Foundation House, um, we, we inquired... Um, uh, much more than other people had in terms of his development and his developmental history. And so it became, became clear from Maria's test, from her history, that, if, for example, he walked and he spoke much later than the other children in the family and much later than was genuinely the case for the other kids and the families around him. And so it seemed to us that there were other things at play as well. We referred him to a clinical psychologist who we knew, who we knew understood refugee trauma, and then there was a diagnosis of intellectual disability and autism. But that happened much, much later. So there was four and a half years of settlement there where those opportunities for earlier support diagnosis were missed, um, you know, and that close and, and close family really fragmented under that, under the stress of that. He was not understood in the school system. He was not provided with the supports that would have been if he'd been appropriately kind of diagnosed at the start. I want to ask you about some work uh, done and the commissioners have got a copy of the We Need to Raise Our Voices, Advice from People of Refugee Backgrounds Living with Disability and Their Carers. So the commissioners have the report. The report uh, is the result of a particular form of community consultation 
and advice. That was involving the Victorian Refugee Health Network. What can you tell the Royal Commission about that process of engaging with uh, newly arrived refugees from Iraq and Syria? And yeah. what, was the, what were the findings of that work? So that work arose out of um, these recommendations from the Victorian Refugee Health Network. And it was a community advisory group uh, between about May 2018 and May and March 2019 with newly arrived people from Iraq and Syria who were living with a disability or caring for a person with a, with a disability. And it really sought, sought to understood and better understand and document the experiences of those people uh, to build the capacity of community advisors. We've talked about leadership in this in these hearings as well and how important that is. So to build up their capacity to, um, to speak and to understand the issues and to speak into that. And also then to build the capacity of the health and settlement um, and disability services to understand their needs better. In terms of, and the other thing I'd like to say is that um, we've provided you with what we call the ITRSM, the Integrated Trauma Recovery Service Model. We also have a community cap capacity building framework, which really outlines our approach to community capacity building in much more detail. Can you provide and I'm that happy to, to provide us? that. Thank you. I'm happy to provide that as well. It didn't occur to us to provide that beforehand, but we can do that. So in terms of the major issues that, that the community advisory group identified, it was lack of knowledge of available services and the capacity to navigate the the, um, the health settlement disability service system. Experiences of trauma affected their ability to self-advocate with service providers or to make complaints and provide feedback. The experience of frustrations with inconsistent and contradictory information from some services was an issue. Language barriers significantly impacted access to and understanding of services and systems. And I had hoped that in 2022, we wouldn't need to talk about just the basic right of being having an interpreter, but that, that's still an issue at a very basic level. Um, prolonged wait times for processing of applications was really significant for them. The NDIS system was confusing. It was unclear. There was a perception uh, of unfairness between different NDIS plans and that the model doesn't consider the additional needs of the whole family and also those people who are newly arrived and their absolute need to engage in settlement. So in some places, it meant that they weren't able to access English classes because they needed to have care and responsibilities for their children, which then of course is gonna impact on the settlement and the success of that family over time. <coughs> um, the emotional and social support needs of the carers were, were really unmet and not, and not considered, which is really crucial as well. Now, we, so someone made a, a comment yesterday afternoon that once um, somebody arrives at the airport in Australia, that's the end of the support for them. That's not quite that's right, That's not quite right, okay. no. But uh, can I ask you about the experiences with the NDIS, accepting mm -hmm. that the NDIS is not a service for every person with disability. The NDIS was raised in that work uh, with the community and one of the barriers for the NDIS was the reliance on self-advocacy in a system that that creates some difficulty for people from refugee backgrounds who have unique experiences of trauma and language barriers. Can you tell us a little more about the nature of that barrier? Yes. And we, we might ask the NDIS about this in a little bit more, okay. NDIA about this tomorrow. Yeah. Um, look, it does create additional kind of unique, distinct uh, barriers, we would say. Um, so NDIS participants from refugee backgrounds can often feel confused or conflicted. Though. On the one hand, feeling really grateful to Australia for being offered safety and fearing that they might be seen as ungrateful or as troublemakers if they complain or self-advocate about the quality of services and supports. Um, many clients and people have come from a situation where not even their basic needs are being met. And so they may not realise the inadequacy of the supports that they're receiving or that that, that support is that may be very different to a support that somebody else might be receiving who's more able to self-advocate. Um, they may feel uncomfortable asking for more. Um, the risks of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation may be increased because people from refugee backgrounds are less likely to be aware of their right to safe and ethical supports. They're less likely to insist on those rights. 
and it also they're also particularly vulnerable then and they may wish they may miss out on those crucial supports altogether. Um, we've also we've also been told how sometimes when people have spoken up and self-advocated and gotten over all of those barriers uh, that some have been met with a racist paternalistic or patronizing response you know along the lines of um, and my apologies here, this, I just feel uncomfortable even saying out these words, but, you know, we've saved you from your country, you know, what more do you want, that, that kind of approach. So you can imagine if someone has taken the courage to actually self-advocate and to ask for more when they get met with paternalistic and racist responses, it's really detrimental. And Foundation House uh, had been working with a teenage girl and you've given a, a, her story here. Mm. She had a diagnosis of a complex genetic disorder and intellectual disability. What was um, that family's experience yes. like with the ND, accessing the NDIS? Yeah. So what, what happened with that is that, yes, the, the family recognised refugees uh, with permanent residency and she was accepted onto the NDIS. Uh, but the NDIS you know, what they've explained to us is that there was no interpreter present at that initial meeting. Um, the plan created after that meeting, not surprisingly, I would say, was, was, was didn't then meet their needs. It wasn't explained to the family. The family were unaware that they were responsible to provide support documentation and additional information from specialists. The family didn't know that they needed to, and furthermore, the NDIS did not do that themselves either. And so as a result, the plan only referred to one of the child's disabilities um, and not the other disability. And so it was, it was just manifestly insufficient to address the complex support needs that she had. We provided, you know, we did that advocacy that is part of the council advocate role and, um, you know, we'll continue to do so so that it's accurately kind of reflected on her plan. Um, but, and the other thing is that, uh, there is supposedly support coordination provided as part of that. But despite that, the family really do not understand the plan. They do not understand the services. And we see little evidence of, of really appropriate services being involved. Um, I think we've touched on the situation of asylum seekers and that uncertainty mm -hmm. as they await um, news about their visa and the visa applications. Can I turn now to the advice that you've provided about removing barriers and supporting best practice models. And um, I'll just ask you to explain some of that, those elements, and then I'll turn to the commissioners and ask them if they have any questions. Yeah. So uh, one of the most important things really is, um, is, is co-designing with people from lived experience. So with training and support, uh, people drawn from refugee and cold communities can effectively bridge that gap between communities and the service providers. Um, they're uniquely kind of placed as members of their own community to increase the knowledge and understanding within that community of the services and supports available. And similarly, to then build the capacity of the service system to provide that in a way that's actually accessible. Uh, Foundation House is another example, provides, for example, psychoeducation groups or classes to people who are newly arrived um, in accessible locations, not just in a clinic-based location, but in TAFEs, in education classes, in outreach kind of ways that really in culturally appropriate ways, usually with uh, somebody from within their community, a community liaison worker or someone within their community, um, explains the potential impacts of the traumatic events they may have experienced and uh, strategies that may assist and helps people understand that that is, a sh that is often a shared experience. And so it decreases the stigma and we hope makes it more likely that whether it's straight away or whether it's down the track, if they need services, that they're more able to access them. Um, so I guess, yeah, there's some more examples here as well. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that we do is um, we work closely with some mental health services. So for example, we have close relationships with some of the child and adolescent mental health services in Victoria. And um, because of that close relationship, we're able, to, um, we're able to discuss referral pathways. And for example, we might have, that they, they might come to our offices to provide some of that mental health support, or we might accompany the client to their offices so that it's, it's trusted and it's, and it's safe. One of the other things um, 
that can be really useful is assisting clients to develop a document if they're in the kind of disability or other service system, to develop a document which outlines the important information about their lives, about their needs, about their preferences. It's a practical way to share information across the system and empowers the clients then to be able to show that to people when they're first engaging. And it gets around that, that feedback that we hear constantly so often about having to repeat your story, having to explain and re-explain and re-explain things. And it's a very simple intervention that can make a big difference. Um, in relationship specifically to the NDIS, what we've observed is that uh, in terms of the NDIS specifically, that skilled and knowledgeable support coordination is really pretty essential as part of a plan for anyone from a refugee background. And of course, that that relies on that support coordination being trauma-informed and culturally responsive and not, uh, not paternalistic. Um, without that, really, people are going to struggle to navigate the NDIS system. Um, most importantly, and we've heard about this in these hearings too, is the government needs to establish ways of ensuring that the voices of people most in need are included in the design, in the delivery, in the evaluation of disability services. Um, that was a key theme of the Victorian Mental Health Royal Commission, um, which called for uh, mental health information and awareness campaigns, for example, and called for the mental health service system to be much more co-designed with people from lived experience. And we would say the same for disability services. Um, and the lived experience needs to be diverse and it needs to have an intersectional lens. Thank you. I'll check if the commissioners have got any questions. Yes, thank you very much. I'll uh, next with Commissioner McEwen. Thank you very much for your um, evidence today. Thank you for your evidence and thank you, Chair. It's been a very informative session. I do have one question. Paragraph 36 of your statement. When you give the example of the family who didn't have access to the NDIS and four and a half years later, they did get support and a diagnosis for their child. I'm wondering if, it might be too early to say, but how is that family going now? I'm wondering if you could update us on their situation. Mm -hmm. uh, Look, I'm not sure right at the moment how they're going, uh, but certainly that, you know, having, having uh, treatment and support that took into account the whole was really incredibly important. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I have a few questions, actually. Um, firstly, we've talked a bit about the NDIS. Foundation House um, is an advocacy service as well. Mm -hmm. and, well, it advocates to government and yes. it provides yes. advice to government. Yeah. Has the NDIS or NDIA, have you been approached or been engaged with them on the development of their call strategy? Uh, not that I'm aware of. There has been, as I said, you know, we've identified, we had that community advisory group. I don't believe that we've approached, like I can check because there's another area of Foundation House that may have been approached, but not that I not that I know of. I feel sure that someone would have mentioned that to me. Um, we... And so the voice, uh, mm. the paper that we've just been referring to, yeah. and which we've read, you don't know if that's been provided to the NDIA? I'm not 100% sure. Um, have you, has Foundation House had any input into the disability strategy, trying to build this strategy? Not that I know of. Can, can I um, also ask you some questions about, um, in your submission, um, paragraphs 52, 53 and 54, which is about the lack of access to services for people on bridging visas. Um, in other material that's been presented um, by call groups and submissions, there is a suggestion that um, many uh, asylum seekers do, after a long time, get granted permanent status in Australia, reasonably high percentage. 
the do you have a view on the long term impact by not providing early services to these people? Um, while some of them are single, some are also couples with children, and their children are denied those yes. services while the status is unknown. I'm trying to get a sense that the harm by doing nothing for people who end up staying where mm. if a service had been provided earlier yeah. might have reduced the burden. Or do you have a sense of that? Yes, look, we would we would certainly say that. Providing services as early as possible makes an enormous difference. So early intervention uh, is much more cost effective. It, it can really um, assist the support families. And then if there are children involved, support the developmental trajectory of those children. So if those children do stay in Australia, if they are granted refugee status, for example, then that they, they, we would hope, uh, will have been much more successful in school, in their education pathways, and, and the whole family being more supported will give those children a much more successful trajectory. So, yeah, we would say that early support and early intervention uh, will, would make a significant difference. And in terms of the, the overlay of trauma, that someone's recovery from experiencing, you know, really uh, traumatic events uh, is, is going to be enhanced if they have safety and if they have support and if they have agency and control rather than rather than uncertainty and lack of access as well. So is it taking a bit of, yes, I suppose a bit of a balancing act. So some people will not be given permanency, sure. um, but those that in the end might be given permanency after a long period are behind. More harm has been done by lack of an intervention yep. to their long-term success in the community. Yeah, that would be true. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much for your evidence, which is very powerful, and thank you for the work that the Foundation does and your role in it. Um, I'm just wondering how you would see the issues you raised today as fitting within our terms of reference. Mm -hmm. uh, the key provision in our terms of reference requires us to inquire into what governments, institutions and the community should do to prevent and better protect people with disability from experiencing violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation, having regard to the extent of violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation experienced by, all, by people with disability in all mm -hmm. settings and contexts. I don't for one moment doubt the importance of the work that is done or the mm. issues you've raised. As far as I can tell, the only reference to violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation in your statement is at paragraph 46, where you refer to certain risks arising. But I'd be interested in your perception mm. as to how the issues you've raised fit within those terms of reference. Yeah. Of reference. Uh, look, we thank you for that, for that question, Chair. We would say that... Um, you know, some of your protections, I guess, against the protections that um, protect people from violence, abuse, neglect um, um, are the feedback mechanisms, the complaint mechanisms, um, the, the tracking and the monitoring mechanisms. And we would think it's they, they are unlikely to work effectively for, for people from refugee backgrounds, um, that unless the system is trauma informed, people from refugee backgrounds are, are unlikely to access those services, which means in a sense there's systemic neglect. And so, um, so that the risks of neglect are greater because people are theoretically entitled to certain services, they can't access those services. And furthermore, when they do access those services, those services may be a lot less effective than they are for other cohorts because of, the, all, of the, all of the lenses that we've talked about. So, uh, that the neglect in there, I think, is quite significant. And there's greater risks of exploitation because of that lack of being able to, the additional barriers, I should say, to being able to self-advocate and to understand one's entitlements and one's right. And so the risks of exploitation are much greater. Perhaps another aspect of it is that you've talked about the importance of a trauma-informed mm -hmm. approach and explained what that involves. Uh, I 
infer from the examples you've given that uh, one of the benefits of a trauma-informed approach is that it avoids neglect by, for example, improving the chances of a correct diagnosis in the health system or improves the chances of uh, people being able to get to the services that they need and, as you say, are entitled to. I thought that might be another way of uh, addressing. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for your uh, statement, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, very interesting and very helpful. And uh, we very much appreciate the oral evidence you've given today to supplement. It. So thank you very much for your assistance. Pleasure. Thank you, Commissioners. Could we adjourn now till 2 p.m.? Yes, it's just after one. We shall adjourn. The Royal Commission is adjourned. The Royal Commission is resumed. Yes, Ms. Eastman. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair and Commissioners. Our next witness is using the pseudonym ZA. And she will not appear on the screen, but she's here with us in the hearing room with her son. And you'll also see that we have Madam Interpreter assisting as well. So everybody has uh, taken their respective oaths and affirmation. And after consultation with ZA, we've agreed that I'm going to read her statement but I'll pause at particular points just to ask um, ZA or ZA if there's anything else that you want to add. So you happy with that? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, ZA, for coming to the Royal Commission to give evidence. And thank you for your statement, which Ms. Eastman will now read. read. And thank you, ZA Junior, for accompanying you as well. Now I'll ask Ms Eastman to read the statement. Thank you. And I, I can say, Commissioners, we've confirmed that the contents of the statement are true and correct. Oh. Ready? Yeah. I was born in Iraq and migrated to Australia on a marriage visa 15 years ago. We live in Shepparton. My husband is also from Iraq. He came to Australia when he was about 10 years of age. He was part of the first big group of Iraqis who moved to the Golden Valley in the 1990s. He speaks both Arabic and English well. I had no English when I first arrived in Australia. I began my English language classes at TAFE in level one. I have three children who were all born in Australia. My eldest daughter is 14, my second son is 10, and my youngest son is three. My daughter was born with de George syndrome, which causes heart problems and learning difficulties. She has had lots of operations on her heart and other parts of her body. She can't talk, hear, eat, or drink properly. She is very active and loves to smile and interact with people. Life in Iraq. I grew up in a large city in Iraq with my parents and brothers. I'm very close to my family and I had a happy childhood growing up. My dad ran a small business and my mum was a housewife. I completed the equivalent to year 12 in Iraq when I was 18 years old. Prior to coming to Australia, I had been on holiday to Syria and Iran. My husband and I got married in Iraq prior to me moving to Australia. 
It was a big decision to move to Australia. I was very scared and I did not know what it would be like. Early life in Australia. When I arrived, I found everything very different here. I didn't like it for the first two to three months. I moved straight to Cobram, a small town in the Goulburn Valley, which was very quiet and there were lots of old people. I moved in with my husband and his family. It was very difficult because I had to adjust to living with new people and I missed my family and friends. However, my husband's family was supportive of me and I am very and I am close to them. Occasionally, we would buy an international phone card so that I could call my family. However, it was expensive and the call would only last for a few minutes and that was it. I couldn't text or video call my family in those years. I became pregnant short, very shortly after arriving in Australia and experienced morning sickness. At 20 weeks, the doctors told me that there was a problem with my baby and that she had major heart problems. They told me I would have to move to Melbourne and stay there for the rest of my pregnancy. So my husband and I moved to accommodation provided by the hospital and stayed there for the next 20 weeks. I had to have an ultrasound every week to check on my daughter. I'll just pause there and check, is there anything that you want to say or add at this point? No. I'll keep going? Yep, keep going. Birth of my daughter. My daughter was born in 2008 with serious heart problems and blockages in her nose. There were lots of problems with her lungs and airways, so the doctors performed a tracheostomy to help her breathe. Our daughter required 24-hour constant care. I had to stay up with my daughter several nights each week to ensure she was breathing. My husband would also do some nights, but less than me. We had a support worker who would come one or two nights per week and a few hours during the day. I felt lonely and isolated. We had to stay in Melbourne for a further 11 months after the birth of my daughter. The first year in Australia was very, a very difficult time for me. After 11 months, my daughter moved to the Shepparton Hospital we found this experience very different to how we were treated at the hospital in Melbourne and expressed concern about our daughter's treatment in Shepparton. The doctors and nurses from the Melbourne hospital came to Shepparton to talk to the hospital staff here about caring for our daughter and supporting us. The nurses were told that they needed to monitor my daughter closely so that we could have a rest. Things improved a bit after this. I had very limited English, and so my husband was my interpreter and translator during my first few years in Australia. He speaks good English and was able to help explain things to me. The staff at both hospitals used interpreters for medical appointments and to explain my daughter's condition. I'm not sure how we would have coped if my husband didn't have good English. It would have been even more difficult. I had support from social workers at the hospitals. They were always with us, along with an interpreter. I wasn't connected with any Arabic-speaking support people in Melbourne or Shepparton. It would have been good to be able to express my thoughts and feelings without needing an interpreter sometimes. My daughter had the tracheostomy until she was four years old. Fortunately, they removed it and she was able to breathe without it. She is unable to swallow, so the doctors inserted a peg into her stomach when she was little. 
so she can be fed through a tube. There were multiple operations during the first four years of her life, and she had a big heart operation when she was four. Since that time, she has only required checkups. My daughter can't speak or hear. We have difficulty communicating with her and use a kind of sign language. My daughter needs a lot of help with daily activities like eating, drinking, toileting and showering. Prior to the NDIS, I did all of these things for my daughter. I didn't get any help with any of these tasks and I don't get a break from my caring role. I'll just pause there. How are we going? Anything? Okay, keep going. Keep going. Prior to the NDIS, my daughter started school when she was five years old at the local special school. Prior to the NDIS, her school would arrange appointments, for example, with a speech therapist. The therapist would only meet with my daughter at school. My husband and I didn't meet with the therapist. Up until she turned seven years of age, my daughter got some allied health support, physio, OT, speech and behaviour support. Some of those therapists would come to our house. I can't remember what government program that was, though it stopped when she was seven. Engaging with the NDIS, and the first topic is access. The NDIS became available to people in Shepparton in early 2019. I first heard about the NDIS through an Iraqi woman who sent me a message. She told me that there was a service provider who was providing services to children in Shepparton. She then came to my house and explained that the government would pay for services and supports for my daughter because of her disability. We then called the NDIS together to register. I had lots of reports about my daughter from the hospital, so I provided these to the NDIS. The first planning meeting with the NDIS was over the phone. It was me, the planner, and the woman who worked for the service provider. I can't remember her role in the organisation, but they started providing support coordination as part of my daughter's first plan. The next topic is support coordination. When my daughter joined the NDIS, we really didn't know much about how it, much about how, that might be a typo there. We did not know much about it. And now um, we realise the manager of the service provider did not explain all the things that we were eligible for. It was as though he was only interested in funding for support coordination and support workers. We never actually met the support coordinator who worked for the service provider, just the manager. For the first two years, we didn't know that our daughter's nappies and special formula, formula could be paid for by the NDIS or that we could access certain allied health services and supports. I had a friend who was using the same support coordinator and she realised that he was basically stealing from her son's package by taking the funds and not providing the service. I confronted the manager and he said he would give us some money, which is probably illegal. He said he would fix our bathroom and organise an OT to try and keep us happy. However, he also said, even if your daughter has access to services and supports for 100 years, she will not learn.
I spent days feeling anxious and worried uh, after he said that. It really stuck with me. Following that, I spent approximately one hour on the phone to the NDIS with an interpreter. I explained what had happened and made a complaint about this support coordinator. I have not heard anything since. Can I stop there? When you say in the statement that you were on the phone to the NDIS and you made a complaint, mm -hmm. do, you, uh, do you know which organisation you were on the phone to and who you made a complaint to? No. No. Has anyone explained to you the difference between the NDIA the National Disability Insurance Agency and the NDIA Quality and Safeguards Commission. No. Do you know no. the difference between those no. organisations? Have you heard of the Quality and Safeguards Commission? No. Do you know anything about the Quality and Safeguards Commission? No. So when you made your complaint to the NDIS, did you believe that you were making the complaint to the right body? يعني مهمة من من اتصلت بهم يعني هم حاولون يعني بالتليفون من شخص إلى شخص يعني فقالوا يعني الشخص اللي تكلمت وياه آخر شيء هو كان هذا ال يعني الخاص بالشكاوى على ال ال NDIS بعد ما أعرف بالضبط اسمائهم أو شنو um, when I called over the phone, I was transferred to many people. Um, and the last person I spoke to was meant to be the person to do with complaints in the NDIS. And I don't know uh, is exactly who they were. And um, you have not heard anything about that complaint since. Is that right? <laughs> وبعد تقريبا اسبوع او اسبوعين راح يتصلون بيك هم يعني مسؤولين عن الشكاوى وشلون يعني يكملون الشكوى يعني ياخذوها بجديه ويشوفون شنو يسوون فبعد ابد ما حد اتصل بي لحد هذا اليوم. Um, I completed my complaint and the, the um, staff on the phone said that all the information we have now, um, we will get back to you in about a week or two. Um, a, a person who deals with the complete the complaints, pardon, will follow up with you. Um, and until now, I've not heard from anybody. Right. Thank you. I'll continue. I then changed a support cord to a support coordinator who is based in Melbourne. All our appointments are over the phone. I have found it very hard to speak with her. The support coordinator also tells me that she finds it hard to find specialists such as OTs or behaviour support specialists in Shepparton or to get an appointment with them. She says it is easier to get appointments with specialists in Melbourne, but these appointments are still by phone, not face-to-face. -face. I don't think there are many supports and services here in Shepparton. I've recently heard about a new support coordinator who is meant to be very good. I'm in the process of trying to change over to her. She is based in a town about an hour away, which means some of our appointments will be face-to-face. -face. Next heading is therapists. My daughter has funding for specialists and therapists, but I'm not sure how often she is meant to see them. I'm also not sure if she sees some of them at her school. The school gives me some updates on how she's going at school, but I don't get updates about how she is going in terms of NDIS supports and services. I feel like all the therapists do is write reports. There have been times when I have asked for specific things 
to help, but they tell me it's not something the NDIS can support. For example, my daughter always wants to go out of the house. She often opens the door and runs out onto the street and we have to go and find her. It is hard to keep the doors locked all the time because our other children want to go out and play in the backyard. We thought it would be a good idea to put a fence across the front yard, which can be locked. An OT said, no, it's very expensive, it's not supported by the NDIS, and that, that it's not that important. This really surprised me. We are paying a mortgage on our house. Can I stop there and ask you a question? Mm -hmm. Do you remember getting a quote, an estimate of the cost of how much a fence would um, cost to put in the front yard? Um, هل تتذكري uh, إنه عملت جبت حد ويقيم لك كم تكلفة هذا mm -hmm. السور؟ إيه جبنا أحد اثنين uh, يعني <coughs> محلات اثنين فقاسوا ال مقدمة البيت يعني وشافوا ال الواحد قال يكلف تقريبا خمسة آلاف والثاني قال تقريبا ستة آلاف أو أكثر. يعني هذا المبلغ كبير احنا ما نقدر ندفعه بصراحه. Um, yes, I um, we got two quotes. Um, uh, two different people came and measured the front of the house. One gave us a quote of approximately $5,000 and the other a little bit over $6,000. That amount is very large and we can't afford it on our own. Did you give that quote to the NDIS? No. Have you heard of something called a restrictive practice? You're shaking your head. No. I assume that means no. Okay. Has anyone uh, explained to you that a fence in your front yard might be a restrictive practice? No. Have you no. ever heard of that? No. Have any of the therapists who support your daughter told you about having a fence being a restrictive practice? I had a man who was talking about 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 a man لا يعني هم بس قالوا لنا ال NDIS ما راح يغطي مبالغ بالالاف يعني المتطلبات ذوي ال... الاحتياجات الخاصه يعني واحنا تقريبا سالناهم اكثر من مره ثلاث مرات تقريبا فنفس الكلام يعيدوا علينا اقصد الاو تي يعني يقولون ال NDIS يقولون ما راح نغطي هكذا مبالغ يعني بالالاف بس هذا الجواب اللي وصلنا. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the, we were told that the NDIS will not cover large amounts in the thousands um, for, for people with uh, special needs. Um, we've spoken about three times uh, and we received the same answer from the OT, which is the NDIS will not fund such large amounts. Uh, mm -hmm. Is your daughter able to play in the front or the back garden of your house? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. يعني وخاصة السياج اللي مو مسدود يعني مسكر فهذا راح يخليها يعني تشوف ناس تشوف سيارات بدون ما يصير خطر على حياتها um, My daughter doesn't like to play much in the backyard she feels restricted like she's still in the house she likes to, she likes open places. She likes to see people and cars. Um, 
and feel like she's left the house somehow. Um, she doesn't like enclosed spaces. And our idea was to provide for her the front fence so she feels like she's left the house and not do a fence where it's all completely blocked, but more like a picket fence where she can see outside and can see still the cars and people coming and going without, uh, well, constructing the fence in the front yard, you know, will give her that opportunity to feel like she's left the house without endangering her life. Thank you. I'll continue. Yeah. The door on my daughter's wardrobe is broken because she kicks it, which is part of her behaviour related to her disability. I asked an OT if we could put a different door on the wardrobe so she can't break it. The OT said I should just hang a blanket on the front of her wardrobe. The slats on my daughter's bed are also broken, but the OT said we should just put her mattress on the floor so she can sleep there. My daughter really likes spending time in an egg chair, which hangs from the ceiling. We visited relatives who had one, and she really enjoyed swinging gently in the chair. I asked the OT to get her one because she is calm and happy when she is swinging. However, the OT said it was too dangerous for her, even though it sits only about 30 centimetres above the ground. I ended up going to the market and buying one for her, and she really likes it. Sometimes I feel I don't know how to communicate with my daughter and understand what she need, wants or needs. She often rips her clothes and my clothes, especially in the morning when we are asleep. It's not that she's angry. I think she's bored. I have asked Centrelink if they can increase payments for my daughter because it costs more to look after her, particularly buying new clothes when she rips them but to no avail. I sew clothes and I make or decorate cakes to sell to the community to make some extra money. But I earn very little and I feel very tired. Mm -hmm. I have told can a behaviour... Can I add something? Yes, of sorry. course. But I wanted to add something to the... الراتب اللي اعطوه سنتر لينك يعني ما اعرف اعتقد اذا يعني الاطفال ذوي الاحتياجات الخاصه يحتاجون رواتب يعني خاصه بهم وهذا الشيء ما عندهم يعني هم هسه حالهم حال الطفل العادي يعني راتبه كلش قليل فهم يحتاجون اكثر يعني مصاريف من من الطفل العادي يعني انا اشوف يعني مثال بنتي يعني هواية تصرف ملابس يعني تقريبا باليوم تمزق تقريبا اربع قطع يعني من ملابسها واظل اشتري لها يعني تقريبا كل اسبوع الملابس او البردات اللي بالبيت الستائر ف يعني اعتقد يعني المفروض لهم رواتب خاصه حتى تكفيهم يعني الاحتياجاتهم um, I just want to add something um, to this um, um, paragraph is that I feel that kids with special needs need, um, in terms of Centrelink uh, payments, need different kinds of payments um, and they don't have that. They are treated like other children, um, but they are not like other children. Uh, for example, like when my daughter rips her clothes, um, sometimes she rips like four pieces of clothing um, and that costs a lot of money um, in a day. Sorry, pardon. Four pieces of clothing a day. And I feel like I need to go every week and buy this clothes. Um, sometimes she rips also the curtains and I also need to buy those. It, there is a need that those those children with special needs um, need to have different payments um, to really cater for their needs um, in comparison to other children. يعني هم صحيح 
الحكومة مخصصة لهم مبالغ كبيرة بال إن دي أي إس بس هاي المبالغ تروح يعني لل شلون يقولوها يعني لل للأخصائيين حتى يساعدوها بس هذا أنا ما شفته يعني ما ما قاعد أشوف مساعدة من الأخصائيين البنتي يعني هاي المبالغ مخصصة فقط لكتابة تقارير يعني أشوف يعني الشغلة الوحيدة اللي مستفادتها حاليا بس السبورت وركر تقريبا ثلاثة أو أربع ساعات باليوم بس يعني هذا ما أشوفه ما يغطي احتياجاتها يعني ما احتياجات هي يعني ما مستفادة منها أو I understand that the government has allocated large amounts of money to NDIS, but I see that these amounts are going to the specialists, really the specialists that are writing reports. I don't really see uh, help, uh, tangible help, um, and I don't see a, a, the only pardon. The only help my daughter gets is having the support worker of three to four hours a day, but that's really not covering her needs, and I don't see her benefiting much. Yeah, محتاجة هي الأخصائيين فعلًا، وبس إحنا ما قاعد نشوف شغل من الأخصائيين، فاا يعني مبالغ جدا كبيرة قاعد تروح فقط لكتابة تقارير لا غير. Yes, my daughter does need specialists. But we don't see the outcome from specialists. Those large amounts are going into writing reports. So I'll continue. Yeah. I have uh, told a behaviour support specialist about my daughter's behaviours. The specialist told me she would arrange posters to be put up in our home to show my daughter how to do things. However, I've been waiting since last year to get the posters. Since my daughter joined the NDIS, no one has come to the house to observe my daughter's behaviours and to support or educate us about how we can respond to her behaviours or support her to develop new skills. Now turn to daily support. My daughter often wakes up in the middle of the night wanting to go out or play. She doesn't care what time it is. This means I often have disrupted sleep because I get up to her and try to help her get back to sleep. I feel very tired a lot of the time. I get up at around 7 a.m. most mornings. I change her nappy and give her a wash. Then I dress her and brush her hair. She doesn't like having things near her mouth, so it can be hard to brush her teeth. I then prepare her liquid food, which goes through her peg. My 10-year-old son is able to get himself ready for school. And my daughter is picked up by the school bus at approximately 8 a.m. My daughter is very active around the home and wants to play with everything when she's not at school. Someone needs to watch her all the time because otherwise it might be dangerous for her. My daughter now has a support worker who comes approximately three hours per day, seven days per week. Sometimes it is more or less depending on what our needs are. She is an Iraqi woman too and speaks Arabic. I found her through community networks and she is employed by a local service provider. The support worker comes after school and often takes my daughter out because she really likes to socialise. She doesn't like staying at home. They will go to a park or fun city. She can walk well enough, but sometimes needs to, uh, need, but someone needs to hold her hand. I don't know if there are any other Arabic speak, speaking support workers locally. I wouldn't mind if a support worker couldn't speak Arabic, that would be okay. In my view, three hours per day is not enough. 
because my daughter needs a lot of care and support each day and night. Now move to the topic of my needs as a carer. I've recently returned to TAFE to finish my Level 3 English course. I leave my youngest son with his dad and go to class from 9am to 1pm, three days per week. I have also studied an online education support traineeship through a local employment provider, which was quite difficult. I'm doing the 120 hours of placement training at my son's school so that I get my certificate. I would like to get a job in the education sector. I have been back to Iraq three times in the last 15 years. However, it has been six years since my last trip. When I went back, my husband cared for our children, so I could only go for two weeks each time. It is very expensive to get to Iraq and a very long way to go for only two weeks. Most people go for at least four to six weeks when they go back to visit from Australia. Mm. Can I add something? Yeah. Um, قبل كم شهر حبيت أسوي فيزا الواحد من أخواني حتى أشوفه ويشوف إنه هو أصلاً ما شايف بنتي أهلي أصلاً ما شايفين بنتي نهائياً وابن الصغير هم أنا ما حد شايفه من أهلي فسويت قدمت على فيزا ورفضوها يعني وقبل هذا يعني كم قبل كم سنة هم أنا سويت فيزا الأمي وهم رفضوها يعني أنا ما أعرف أشوف أحتاج يعني أحد من أهلي يجيني مثلا كل كم سنة في ثلاث أسابيع أو شهر فما أعرف حبيت أذكر هذا الشيء I would like to add something a few months back I applied for a visa for my brother to come and visit me because my kids haven't seen my family and my family haven't seen my kids. Um, and that visa was rejected. Also, a few years back, I also applied for a visa for my mother to come and stay with me. Again, that visa was also rejected. I feel like I need my family to at least come and stay with us for three weeks or a month. I'll continue. Okay. It is hard now because my daughter is no longer little. She has reached puberty, which means that it's not appropriate for my husband to care for her. However, I really miss my family and friends in Iraq. And it has been very difficult not to go home for such a long time. I would really like to go home to visit them for two to three weeks. When I spoke about this issue with the teachers at my daughter's school, they mentioned the option of respite. They said that they think I have to pay for it and it's really expensive because it would be full-time care if I was overseas. Just recently, a social worker from the school called me and said it can cost thousands of dollars per week and the NDIS doesn't pay for it. I'm not sure if she was talking about my case specifically or that the NDIS doesn't pay for respite generally. I don't think my support coordinator or anyone connected with the NDIS, like a planner, has ever spoken to me about the possibility of respite so that I can have a break and visit my family in Iraq. I don't remember anyone ever telling me that I can ask for respite to be funded in my daughter's package, particularly now that she has reached puberty. It would make a big difference to our family's well-being if my husband and I could have an occasional break from caring for our daughter and for me to be able to visit my family for a few weeks in Iraq. I recently asked the support coordinator to ask the NDIS about respite because we are due for an appointment in October to discuss my daughter's new plan. 
I think this will be my daughter's third plan. The community understands that my daughter has a disability and is very accepting of her. Some of the other children are a bit scared of her or think that she's trying to hurt them. My daughter really loves to play with other children, but she doesn't know how to do it. She might grab their T-shirts or push them down. She's being friendly, but the other children don't understand, so it is very hard. The future. Going forward, I really need support from the allied health specialist to teach my daughter how to do some things by herself and to be more independent. For example, she can't brush her own teeth. I also think the government should provide an extra allowance for people like my daughter. All the money goes to the workers, but I don't feel like my daughter is getting what she needs. I hope that my daughter will get the support and services she needs to live a happy life where she is part of the community and can learn and experience new things. Thank you for your statement. Is there Thank anything you. else that you wanted to tell the commissioners? Yani, bas al al. أتمنى السبيشالست يقومون بعملهم بالصورة الصحيحة ويساعدون الأطفال اللي محتاجين مساعدة فعلية يعني هذا كل اللي أتمنى. My hope is for the specialist to do their work to their best of their ability to help. Those children that need it most. That's my only hope. Thank you. I'll check if the commissioners have got any questions that they want okay. to ask you. Yes, Commissioner McEwen. Thank you. I don't have any questions, but I do want to say thank you for telling us your story and for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. The um, new support coordinator that you want, are they independent from a service provider or would it also be a new service provider and the support coordinator is working for that service provider? حاليا بتعمل باستقلالية أم تعمل تحت مقدم خدمة؟ أي باستقلالية يعني هاي اللي اللي سجلنا وياها مؤخرا هي تعمل باستقلالية بس إحنا بعدنا لسه ما بدينا شغل فعليا لأن صار المطر والفيضان اللي بشبرتن فمتوقف كل شيء حاليا. Uh, yes, she is an independent uh, support coordinator, but we haven't officially engaged with her um, because of the recent rain and flooding in Shepparton. Do you think the previous support coordinator that worked for the service provider, one of the reasons that you did not get to know everything your daughter was entitled to was because they worked together and all they told you about is what that service provider could give you. هل برأيك انه كان في اتفاقية بين منسقة الدعم ومزود الخدمة وما وعشان هيك ما خبروكي كل شيء بنتك بتحتاجه؟ أعتقد I think so, yes. Thank you. I see from your statement that your daughter goes to school. I don't want to know the name of the school, but is that a general school or a school for children with disability? 
من التقرير المدرسة بنتك تذهب للمدرسة ما في داعي ذكر اسم المدرسة هاي هي مدرسة أخصائية للأطفال أخصائية للديسابيلتي A special school for kids with disability And your daughter is usually picked up by the school bus at 8 o'clock in the morning What time does she normally get home? Around the 3 3.15 or 3 Right Yeah and the support worker then comes to your home when your daughter gets yeah. home from school. Is that yeah. right? Yes. Yes. Um, you've said that uh, three hours a day is not enough because your daughter needs a lot of care and support mm -hmm. each day and night. You say that at paragraph 46. Yeah. What additional support would you like to see for your daughter? Yeah, and he works the... أحتاج الدعم أكثر من السبورت ورك لا يقصد من من غير السبورت ورك. Interpret thank you. أم بسألك حضرتك قلتي إنه بنتك تحتاج أكثر من ثلاث ساعات باليوم إضافية للمساعدة شو هي الأشياء اللي بتحب تشوفيها أو الخدمات الإضافية اللي بنتك محتاجة غير ثلاث ساعات يوميا؟ مو هي بنتي يعني. أغلب الأيام يعني ما تروح يومية يومية للمدرسة دائما هي إما مريضة أو إذا ما نايمة بالليل فتريد تنام الصبح يعني فجر فما أقدر أوديها للمدرسة أشوفها تعبانة فهي دائما تعبانة و يعني مو دائما هي تروح للمدرسة يومية يومية. Uh, just a note that my daughter doesn't go every day to school. Um, some days she's not well, some days she's not slept through the night and she needs that morning sleep and I obviously can't take her to school. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, in paragraph 37, you say you asked Centrelink if they could increase payments for your daughter because of the cost of looking after her. Did someone advise you to go to Centrelink to do that? حكيتي بفقرة 37 إنه طلبتي من سنتر لينك يزيد لك دفعات المبلغ حتى تتمكني من رعاية بنتك أفضل هل حدا خبرك عن هذا الموضوع إنك تتكلمي مع سنتر لينك؟ You decided that. Yeah, I decided. And what did Center Link tell you when you went there? يعني قالوا ما ما عندنا هيك خدمة إحنا سألتهم ما أذكر مرتين أو ثلاثة إذا أصير أني كيرر يعني حاليا أبوها الكيرر زوجي سألتهم إذا أني أقدر هم أصير الكيرر عليها لأن أنا مطالبة بعمل همينة وهم حتى يزيد الراتب شوية فقالوا ما عندنا هيك خدمة يعني الطفل ما له أصلا راتب خاص الحد ما يصير فوق ال 16 سنة وما يصير اثنين بالبيت كيرر على الطفل Mm -hmm. uh, they advise that there's no such service or payment and um, at the moment um, my, my husband, my daughter's father is her carer and I asked Centrelink if maybe I could be a carer for my daughter because I'm also required to work. Um, I asked about two or three times and um, they said that there is no such thing uh, like this payment, uh, the child has an independent payment when they reach 16 years of age, and it's not possible for a child to have two carers. Yes. I see. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, Ms. Eastman, does that conclude this part of the evidence? That concludes um, ZA's evidence, and we thank her very much for coming today, and also her son, who has sat very patiently. So thank you very much. Thank you. And if we can adjourn for 10 minutes so we can reconstitute the hearing room for our final witnesses today. Well, again, thank you very much for thank you. Uh, your statement <laughs> and for giving evidence uh, this afternoon. We appreciate your coming to the Commission and explaining uh, the experiences that uh, you have had and speaking on behalf of mm -hmm. your daughter. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you to Mr. Zeda. You, you did an excellent job. <laughs> Thank you. Good the Royal Commission is adjourned.
The Royal Commission is resumed. Yes, Ms. Uh, thank, thank you, Commissioner. So our final three witnesses are here and I want to uh, tell you a little bit about the work that they do before I ask each of them to introduce themselves. So our witnesses this afternoon represent wise, well women community health educators. The, and I'll call them for shorthand, the community health educators. They help community, they help with health and community services. They communicate with parents, with children and young people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. They assist their community by providing information to connect people to services and to understand what services are available. They provide emotional support for people from time to time. They are uh, able to provide informal interpreting, but they have cultural knowledge, they have cultural understanding, and they understand the experiences of their community. So our three witnesses this afternoon all completed the training to become community health educators in April 2021, along with some other women. They each have stories of coming to Australia, some as refugees and some uh, through other forms of migration. We've had the chance to engage with them as we've prepared for this hearing. And I know they feel a little bit nervous this afternoon, but you'll recall yesterday that we heard about the importance of community and community leaders. And you'll recall, I think, that Dominic, who might, who's not here this afternoon, said that he was going to take a risk and talk about the importance of women leaders and women as strong advocates. And I hope that you'll find our panel this afternoon to be women of that character. Iman, may I start with you? Just, just before you start, may I welcome you to the Royal Commission. Thank you very much for coming today and giving evidence. And uh, let me reassure you, there is no need to be nervous. We are all exceptionally friendly. <laughs> Thank you. you usually, know how, usually. Yeah, you know how the country people, when they come to the city, they may, they will be nervous. <laughs> <And then. sighs> um, so I've asked each of them to start by introducing themselves in the way they would like to and to tell the commissioners about their story. So, Iman, are you happy to go first? Yes. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to, uh, to share our stories and experience. My name is Iman. I'm from Iraq. I have been in Australia for almost 20 years. I would like to speak about significant effect of mental health and post-traumatic stress disorder on my community as on myself. In our culture, we have different definition for mental health. It is always surrounding with a very negative stigma. We even don't know, we, do, we don't use the same translation of this term. That's how we hide it and try to avoid talking about or seeing a counselor or a specialist, even though it is a crucial and important to deal with with the issue that with the issue in a logical way. It is clear that mental health disability lead to physical disability. For so for someone who escaped his or her uh, her country home, can by boat looking for a safety to start a better life and because of no support ending his life with a drugs. Another a mature adult couldn't cope with being unable to, stay, to easily learn English or work in their expert and developed severe mental health. 
This person constantly, constantly moved between Australia and Iraq, unable to settle in one or other country. Another example is a new arrival young student who couldn't get support in his learning journey and ended up lost with a drug habit. The organization, organizational support was intimate and never consist, consistently leaving the young person with a genuine support. Sometimes this makes me wonder if being treated like, you know, like a discrimination or different culture or just our work system. This, the three things I mentioned is like uh, not scenarios. It's like a real story from my community and from myself. That's why I, I get so emotional. Iman, uh, you came to Australia by boat uh, about 20 years or yes. so ago. And when you arrived in Australia, you spent some time in immigration detention. I spent like uh, six months in Wombra Detention Centre. And when you arrived, uh, were your children quite small at that time? Yeah, my youngest one was um, like three years old. My oldest one was six uh, years old. And uh, you left uh, Iraq. And before you left Iraq, you had completed a Bachelor of Biological Science at Baghdad University. And yeah. you had been a teacher in Iraq. Yeah, I finished my degree in Iraq uh, as a biology teacher. And I worked there for three years. And after that, you know, when the war started and the conditions were become worse and worse, so we escaped. And when, when you first came to Australia, after you were released from immigration detention, you settled in a small town in Victoria? Yeah. And for the first, you know, first few years, even first five or ten years, what was the experience for the family? Um, I was a happy person who escaped the country and looking for a safety life, you know, looking everything, you know, looking looked in a positive view and then um, the first five to ten years we were moving from house to house from town to town I went to South Australia and then back to um, Cobram and then to Shepparton so I wasn't care much about you know moving and not settling very well but I was uh, concentrated or and focused on my children um, on their teaching, on their study, and on myself to, you know, improve my English to get work and to help others as well from my community. And the scenarios that you've described just now mm. and saying that they're not scenarios, they're true stories from your community and your own family is you've shared this for the first time with the Royal Commission to help understand about mental health as a disability and how the trauma yes. of coming to Australia from a, a war country can come up at times that perhaps are not even expected in the families. Is That's that right? right? That's right, because I, I witnessed, I saw uh, many other families suffering from a mental health, from stress, not support their children with a learning journey. Even some of them, they didn't finish their learning, their education, because they are here in, in, in Australia and somewhere in Shepparton or in Melbourne rural areas. They didn't finish their uh, education. Uh, I wasn't, you know, um, thinking, I wasn't, you know, taking this in uh, serious or uh, considering this is because our mental health illness or um, past tra uh, traumatic disorder or a stress. I was, oh, this is, you know, hardship of life. But yeah, that's how we struggle. We didn't get, you know, some sort of support to cope with this in your life because 
Changing life is not easy. Starting a new life with a new culture, a new language is not the things is easy. This is what is comes now and affected us. Right, so I'm going to ask um, your colleagues on the panel to introduce themselves and then we'll come back and talk about some of the topics. Thank you. So I'm just checking, Mushkan, would you like to be uh, the next person? So you came to Australia directly from Kabul in 2009. You were 15 years old then. And uh, can you take the commissioners on the story since then, including what happened to your father? Um, first of all, hi to everyone who actually um, in this room and hearing this um, uh, and the information that we are actually giving. Um, Dad left Afghanistan in 2001, and that was the the night that he left when they actually um, the war started. I'm going to ask you to slow down. Okay. Okay. Yep. So there's nothing to be worried yep. about, but just slow down a little bit. And okay. Can all follow. Yeah. Um. So the dad left Afghanistan, which is Kabul, in 2001. And that was the time when we actually grew up like not having a man in our home due to Taliban. So I was kind of like through my childhood, I have seen, um, I have grown up as a, um, as a female, seeing uh, females on the street has been punished by the Taliban. As my childhood, I have been representing being a boy outside and pretending that being a boy uh, to save, to stand next to women on the street um, to save their life and represent myself that pretending that I am actually uh, the, um, the man of the house. However, I was a female because they didn't notice whether I'm a male or a female due to my age. Um, since that left Afghanistan, so he was in Nauru detention center for five years. The first four, five, uh, four years, we wasn't sure whether he was alive or not because the Taliban came and attacked our home after that left. And uh, then since then, that he was keep regularly checking and then grandpa said that dad passed away. Um, until uh, one of our relatives come and say, look, your dad is at the detention center. So that got mental health issue uh, from being a detention center for five years. Um, and that is, this is the story that most of the um, Afghani community, the place where I live is, and all of the cold community is, the male usually have, most of them has been through the detention center and got mental health um, from there. Um, then we come to Australia in 2009, um, and then through coming coming to Australia in 2009, since then I did went through a lot of, um, faced a lot of challenges. I feel like I have born into a new country. The only thing I knew that I have to how to feed myself inside my home, but anything outside, it was everything was new for me. The language, the culture, transport, and everything. People, that the voice I was hearing. Um, was different. Having been to Longwood Center due to the explanation that I actually arrived and um, we actually end up um, get, got lost. And then uh, they say that if you get lost, just call triple zero if you're in trouble. We end up actually going, the police took us back home to our home. Then since that, that decided to not go to Longwood Center and straight, he put us to school and then through that, we struggle and with no English, we try to actually cope our, with our education and no, didn't have anyone at home to help us with our education. Either the only hope we had was homework club. Um, since then, I actually decided to actually assist the cold community as I have been educated in my home country and continue my first language. Um, and graduated in 2013 from high school. Through that, I did some certificates. Um, and also um, work um, as well. Um, so the place that I have been working is um, uh, trying to actually assist the young generation, uh, like the generation that are called and they're supposed to actually apply for NDIS. 
Um, and these are a big challenge, the way that we went, and Iman has been mentioned, it is about uh, anything that's called disability, the community backup. And we have to encourage them, tell them and twist around and kind of tell them, no, this is not, um, this is not something like, um, that you think it's kind of like trying to help and understand and it's all right to actually um, apply for NDIS. Um, we apply for this um, amount of the, um, the generation that have the disability disorder and or needing difficulty on June. We apply this application to NDIS the same time with the people that has been born in here and this is their home country. They uh, qualification and the form went through within two months, the latest one. Some of them got replied back in a winter month. We have been waiting since, um, sort of since uh, June till now that they keep the call, call of applications keep rejecting. Um, we, I'm not a qualified interpreter and I know this is illegal when you are not a qualified interpreter to do interpreting for the community. Unfortunately, the community don't have interpreters, face-to-face -face interpreters, especially when you have people from the community have mental health issue over the phone. They took them back to trauma. They took them back to like re-traumatize them. So I step in and the community always ask us to do the interpreting and translating for them, uh, whether it's written translated or as audio messages. Um, and can I jump in yeah. there because I want to come back and ask you all about that role yeah. that you play connecting the community members but can I introduce yeah. Zara first yeah okay Zara uh, you are also from Afghanistan yeah. and you completed your primary school in Afghanistan but you then spent 10 years in Syria where you finished secondary school and you've also spent time in Iran. Tell us how you came to Australia. I born in Afghanistan, and when I was eight years old, we moved to Iran for, I and mean, I stayed there for two year and four years. And then I came to, uh, to Syria. I went to school in Syria, and then I, we've been as a refugee and registered in UNHCR. Um, but I came here in Australia by sponsor visa. My husband was here and then I came here. I, I studied at TAFE for a few years and then I started working um, in the organization that's supporting new arrival families. So all three of you have uh, your own experience of coming to Australia, sometimes with family, sometimes without family. And all three have decided that you want to work with your communities and help connect the community to services. So first question I wanted to ask you is about the shame and the stigma of disability. You have told us that from the communities, sometimes people feel shame that a family member has disability. It might be physical disability, intellectual disability, or mental health issues. Do you want to tell the Royal Commissioners about what happens when people have that shame to be able to ask for help? You know, when the people are coming to Australia, in the beginning, they are very excited. They are coming to new places, new future, uh, new like opportunities. And when they come here, they are very happy. And then after a few times, when they see the barriers, they see different culture, different, different language, they couldn't find a job, they couldn't, uh, you know, communicate, they will feel down. They will feel down and then after a few times when they start learning in English, they start finding jobs, they start finding friends, they, they feel okay, not that much excited, not that much down. But people with a the disability, they, they, 
it's hard for them to go back to the normal because they they uh, there is lots of barriers for them and they don't know the service. And some of the families, like in the culture, they feel shame. They don't want to talk about the disability. They don't want to talk about, um, you know, uh, the, the, the something that they are missing in them. They don't want to talk about that. Uh, just because they don't want to people feel sorry for them or uh, if it's a girl, they don't like they, it's, they think that the, in future they will not find a partner or the people will feel sorry or they feel down. They are, so they are not, they, they don't want to talk about, about the disability. We know in the community, there is many, many people that have a disability, but we don't know, no one's mm. talking about it or they, they don't want to, uh, some of sometimes families they don't want to believe that that child has a disability or that person has a disability. Iman, in your experience uh, over twenty years, yeah. you have worked with families in the community where somebody acquires so gets a disability, but sometimes children born with disability. Have you seen that experience? of people feeling shamed or sad? Yes, especially when um, I was like a, a multicultural aide with the school, with the new arrival uh, children. They have like uh, some of them uh, learning difficulty or um, English learning difficulty as well. As, so um, I say like 80% of them, um, they have that, you know, sort of learning or English learning uh, difficulty so um, I haven't seen any uh, support from any other program to support them with their you know uh, starting to be um, uh, learn and uh, settle here in, in Australia and that's happened with me as well with my own son he was such a, because he uh, he arrived like um, three uh, years old and he was you know having this difficulty, but I don't know. I was thinking he's like other, um, my other children. He, he, he got this difficulty and no one um, give him uh, a support. He was treating like other children, but that's affected, affected him in, in later in his life. He was one of uh, many, many others uh, I saw. Yeah. Mushkan, uh, you mentioned earlier that for the men who have spent time in immigration detention, that it is not uncommon to see the mental health issues for the men. And in your work with young people at school, you have seen the family violence. And this is a, a shameful topic to talk about, of the violence in the family and the support for the men with the mental health problems. You've seen the children at school and to be able to talk about this issue is very hard. What can you tell the Royal Commissioners about that experience? Um, first of all, for us, like mental health, the translation word for mental health is crazy. So we actually, the, our community, like the region area that I live, we completely changed the meaning of mental health. We translate it into a different meaning whether the community understand and try to actually assist the community to reach for help. With accessing to mental health problem, there's less help is available, not for only men, as well as women in the community. Because when you have someone who in a home have mental health. What we have noticed is the past two years now that a lot of women is suffering from mental health, but they don't know that they have mental health. Again, accessing to uh, services that it has been just recently arrived to region area for cult community, they need interpreters. 
when we say interpreters, we want face-to-face -face interpreters. Unfortunately, there is no face-to-face -face interpreters in region area. We um, sometimes the community asks us to do the interpreting for them. Is that uh, difficult if you have to be the interpreter? We we have it is difficult, but to our only um, main goal is to assist the community and help the community. As I mentioned it before, I know it's illegal to do interpreting when you're not a qualified interpreter, but there's no other options has been left for us. The same with COVID. We did the translating and audio messages with the same with the flat that recently has been just happened. So we was the one who actually had to step in and do that. Well, um, regards to the trust, to, sorry to say that interpreters over the phone, as I say, as I mentioned it, if you're suffering from trauma or mental health problem, due to the connection or like you can hardly hear what the interpreter is saying and it is re-traumatizing and making, giving them uh, mental health to solve this problem is, um, we tried it to actually be a qualified interpreter with um, doing the, setting the course and to be a qualified interpreter, they asked us to come to Melbourne. But the problem is if I go to Melbourne, I'm a female, single female, my whole family is going to come to Melbourne. There's no chance for me to come back to ship and assist the cult community with the interpreting. Yes, I'll, I will get it, but the qualification. So what's the point of me when I have the experience and everything I have been doing since 2014? But unfortunately, if I leave then this community as all the interpreters, all the other um, cult community leaders that has been done, they never come back. So this the region area that I'm living is pretty much, we always get the new arrival. They settle in the community. Once they get used to the culture, a little bit learn English, then they move to another states. So to help this problem, use the people that trying to actually, the community leaders trying to actually assess the community and make them to be qualified. And that is to stop actually re traumatizing and increasing the mental health um, of the region area. And this is not only in, about interpreting, it's anything that with filling out the forms in the eyes, it's hard because as soon as they, you ask and request for an interpreter, the time limit will go, will be double or triple. And that's the problems that the region areas are facing. Can I uh, turn to a different topic? And from your experience, the local school can often be the first place where a child is identified as having a learning disability. And I, I think both Mushkan and Iman, you have seen that it is the teachers who might pick up or identify that a child who's newly arrived to Australia has a disability. What happens in that circumstance if the teacher identifies the disability? How does that affect the family? Yeah, for, uh, for me, um, the, obviously the family, you know, something new for them, they not accept it. And also for the child, I haven't seen, yeah, from my own experience and others, I haven't seen uh, any, you know, um, serious support from the school. Rather than, you know, uh, having, um, could be teacher aid or other, uh, you know, like um, multicultural aid, which is not like, um, um, the the right support like a consular or uh, what is called pathology or um, other uh, you know uh, sort of support. If a, a family uh, who has a, a a young child starting school and the teacher or the teacher's aide thinks that child might have learning difficulties, does the school have a responsibility? of working with the family to get supports 
And Mushkan, I know you have a role as uh, assisting students from newly arrived backgrounds. Yeah. How does the school work with the families to provide support? Um, I work at different job titles, and one of the jobs that I work is as a multicultural years officer. Um, so what happens is we go to class and assist the new arrivals, the students' English as additional language or language. Um, what would happen is, unfortunately, a lot of the ill students are, uh, it's hard, I do understand, it's hard for the teachers to actually recognize whether they have learning difficulties or not due to the lack of English. So when we go over there, like we can, for us, it depends how many, each person's difference. So I've been working since 2014 with the Department of Education. I found it really easy. If I attend two classes regularly with the students, I can quickly pick up with us English or learning this disability. But just stopping this, so yeah. the question might be, is the learning difficulty the language, being able to speak in English? Or is the learning difficulty maybe a disability? Yeah, that's the part that it's really hard for a teacher, especially for ELA students, to be recognised whether they have uh, language barriers, English, uh, or they actually have learning difficulties. So we actually report it and we fill out the form and says, look, um, we are assuming that this child has learning difficulty and that's the time that we need to actually let the family know and that's a big challenge. Sometimes the family refuses, so we have to keep encourage them. But regards to the application, again, um, if unfortunately, if the students in year 10 and apply for learning disability, it will take the whole year to approve. By the time they actually reach, if it does start, it will be, they will be in year 11. And then sometimes the school says, oh, it's too late. Let the child actually, it's nearly the child will be graduated or the students will be graduated from school. Unfortunately, those students are missing to be, a co to be recognized that have, they have learning difficulties. Okay. Yeah, I hope this answered the question. Well, thank you. Thanks. Sarah, can I ask you, you've worked as a multicultural officer and part of your job has been helping newly arrived migrants to understand service systems. And you've also had a short time working as an NDIS support coordinator. Yeah. Can I ask you to uh, share with the Royal Commissioners what your experience has been for people in the community to even know about the NDIS or what their attitudes towards the NDIS might be? From my experience, I find out that the community, they have a very low uh, uh, education about the NDIS or about the disability uh, service providers or any service that available for the disabled people. Like they don't know, even if they know, like for the dis disability for the NDIS, they don't know how to find the report, the, provide the report or explain the needs they want. Like they don't know what to ask. So in that case, they, you know, for the planner, they, the, the amounts that they are eligible become low and they don't know what to, to ask for, for from NDIS. Like I know someone, she, she is disabled and she don't know that she's eligible to have a chair, like uh, to sit. She's, she, she's sitting in normal chair and putting a cardboard underneath her and putting her, her leg on the table. And then when I ask uh, from her support for, like provider to provide her a chair, and she said, no, I don't want that chair because I don't have the money to pay for that chair. Then I explained to the, to the disabled person, individual, that you are not paying anything, that NDIS will pay that for you. So they don't know what they, uh, they write. Maybe they, they, are, they are coming from the country that they, uh, the, you know, war, and they, they have a very low acceptation that's what to ask from, from the provider. 
Iman, uh, how do people in the community learn about the NDIS and their eligibility? How do they learn about that? They don't know about it, definitely. Uh, for me, I just, when I joined the group, I heard about the DNIS. So um, there is not much people know about it. So even though um, when we had the, um, the session for um, to meet with the Disability Royal Commission people from uh, Melbourne, um, the people who invite them uh, to come, they don't have much information. So we talk about that. So we have a bit of uh, you know knowledge about that. So otherwise, if they hear from us or from the community or no one can, they have their uh, you know English or their language to to do them some research or uh, to find out. Yeah, and maybe you know through the. I, I'm, I don't think so that GB will refer for that. Would, um, would the community use the internet to look at information online to find out about the NDIS? It depends if they have the language in English, they might use it, you know. And um, Mushkan, you're shaking your head. <laughs> for my community, to be honest, there's only 15, 10 to 15% of the community can read and write in the first language. However, using the technology and using their phone. The only thing that they know is really, really good at Viber and WhatsApp because that's the way that they can actually call home and um, for um, to speak with their um, families in their home country. Um, no, they can't access to any information. The only information that they can actually get is through audio messages translated in the first language. So Sometimes people, they don't know if they have a disability or not. Like I know a, a lady, she had a child and the child had a like skin problem. And that skin problem, she, she you know, she been here for a few years and the child went to kinder, maternity, childhood, school, and no one told her that that child has a disability. And like I've been with her as well, and for a few years, I know her for a few years. Suddenly, by accidentally, I asked her that, you know, your child has, uh, you know, allergic skin allergy, and that skin allergy, why it's not become better? Do you use any product? And then she said, no, it's not the skin allergic, it's uh, like disease. And then when I went and I searched for, she, she told me the name. And then when I went and I searched and I found that this is a disability and no one talked to her about disability and she don't know, no, not, to, not maternity childhood, not kinder and not even school taught her about disability. So how can she go and, and go and search for, for the support if she don't know that this is a disability? What um, information do you think the community need to help them understand about disability or understand about what support might be available for disability? Who wants to, Iman, do you want um, to answer that one? Especially for mental health, we have a big, you know, a uh, big gap to understand the mental health and the support um, uh, that's in terms to give them, uh, you know, uh, a support in this, um, you know, uh, issue. So this mental health, it's lead to disability health, as I mentioned. So if they understand the problem from the beginning, so they, they then they will um, understand what, what's their right. So it's, I guess, it's through the organizations there or um, uh, sessions or informations so to know about the, the services. How, um, put it this way, what is the best way to get the information to the community who need to know? Either by, for, for the people who's not working, by the center link and or by their, um, the school. It's the best to start with the families and with the children. 
So. I think maternity child sex, kinders, and uh, you know, community leaders. We can we can provide the information in the first language. So we we educate the uh, educate the leaders, and then they will find out, and then they will educate the others. Like you know, now when the people know that I'm the uh, community health educator, they come and ask me. And this is a good opportunity that I know, you know, more information than I give, I provide that information to them. That puts um, a lot of responsibility on you as the community health educators. So, yeah, we are part of that community. We have lots of other, uh, you know, community leaders. We have like mosque, uh, imam in mosque. We have lots of other people who are responsible, you know, who are part of active in the community. We can educate those people so those, those people can, like, pass that information to the uh, members, of community members. Do you all feel a heavy responsibility having to be the community leaders? Yeah, sometimes it's, it's like, very heavy uh, responsible and sometimes you feel that you are not uh, you are not doing the right job like you don't you it's not enough the information that you pass that is not enough and sometimes you feel that oh maybe it's not right maybe you passed by accident you passed the wrong information to them maybe you hurt them by that information maybe so there is many uh, possible that we think that it makes us feeling very heavy responsible. Iman. <laughs> um, the last few years, I've been through lots. That's what made me to come and to talk. Because my son, one of my family, has been through lots of problems. When he first arrived, no one diagnosed him with the learning difficulty or English difficulty. I don't know what it is. And uh, in the middle of his learning journey, he lost the way. And I realized what's, what's going on. I've been focusing on them to uh, support them, to, you know, uh, to teach them and educate them to have a better future here. And I don't know what's happened to him. Um, like it's very, I, it's yeah. very, you feel very heartbroken. I know yes, you've told us about it. It's difficult to talk about. Yeah, I, I feel I couldn't mm. finish my mission here with my children. And then, because no support, he fell in with the drug habits. Yeah. And later, I know there is many, many in my community. Oh my God, I need to talk, even though I feel shame, even though I feel shy. So I need to give the message to the people. That's okay. I will deal with this problem. So I will get the support. I went through all the organization in my town, but I didn't get any support, serious support. Like, I went in many, many others people to ask. I haven't get any support, um, serious support for him to get over this habit. Lately, I've been controlling him with my own, you know, my own experience to get over that things. I just want him to support him gradually to um, start a, a course you know, uh, studying course with him, being advising him, being, you know, uh, doing this from my own experience, my own search. Um, I did the mental health first aid with the girls, the training, I did it. So I just want to understand him and understand the situation. So I will be able to deal with him. So this is, if this comes to me as a, a person, and came to Australia, I'm sure there is many, many others affected by this. And lately I saw there's many, many uh, other families. Uh, they don't have the support. They don't have the knowledge. They don't have uh, the language. How they can cope with that? 
You, Iman, you support a lot of families and you also have this very close to home in your own family. The three of you do so much work for the community. How can you build greater community involvement and support? So the burden is just not on a very few small number of people. How do you do that? Being caring for others, being helping others, and encouraging others and understanding others as well. Hmm. We living here in Australia for me uh, almost 20 years. My other children, they are brilliant, contributing their you know, life and working in the hospital and doing a great job. This is what we give to our community and our society. So I decided to share that and being, you know, um, together to help others to get over what they have from issue, either mental health or other disability. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's, I think this is the mm. good idea or a great idea. To Sarah, do. did you want to say something? And then I'll ask Mushkan. I think, you know, we all need to try hard to make a better community. Like we try our best, but I think it's not enough. We need the other support for the, you know, from different organization and different communities uh, for new arrival family or whole community to, to, you know, receive a better support uh, from the, from the service that available for them. Mm -hmm. Like I think we can ask for from the type the language. Uh, English language centers that provide the, uh, you know, working with new arrivals, because, you know, those people can, you know, provide information, educated people, new arrivals, uh, that support is available, mm -hmm. or those information are available. Mm -hmm. So all of us need to work hard to be, to have a better mm -hmm. community. Mushkan? Um, for me, to be honest, since when I arrived in Australia and I promised something to myself and I said, like, this country gave me a new bed, a bed that a place where I can live in peace and have all my right. And in return, I said to myself, I need to do something at least to give it back to this country. So my goal is, to be honest, is to assess, doesn't matter whether they are from my culture or not, to assess and try to actually tell the new, the new generation, the community to actually follow the right step and also pass whoever actually helped them, pass that and pay that back by helping and assisting the other people, doesn't matter regardless of the color, the skin of color, religion, culture, the language they speak. That is how the nature of life works, to be honest. To educate the community is the best thing is to actually assist them and give them the right information without regards to if they can speak English, give them in the information in the first language. Everything, even when you build a house, if you actually build it a strong and cons the construction, the structure, if it's strong at the start, it will last for long. If you quick and hurry, it will not, not last for, uh, for long time and it will damage. So it will be good if this information actually be given to the communities at the first in a, as early as as possible, then it will not impact, we will not having people with loss of mental health problem, trauma or re-trauma. For example, the people who has been at detention center, however, they, the children haven't, but the children will experience trauma from the story that they hear from the parents. Can I, before I ask the commissioners, they might have some questions. For each of you, what is the most important 
support that you think your community needs now to assist those members of the community who live with disability? Iman, do you want to go first? I haven't, I didn't give you prior notice of that question. Yeah. <laughs> so if you want time to think about it, that's fine. But what I, was the most important thing? I think to get, you know, the right service and the right responsibility from, because when someone turned to the uh, NDIS, they don't know their rights or their responsibility. So they need to be up front of what the service they, you know, um, the worker, they need to explain the, their uh, rules and the, what the service they provide for them. They don't assume the person who understands or knows uh, what they uh, expect from the organization or whatever, you know. So they need to know in, in the beginning. Because for me, if I go to them, I don't know what is my right and what I get from them. Mm -hmm. So they need to, to know this is an upper front. Sarah? I think it's similar to what Iman said, that, uh, you know, when it's important that when the person go to one service, that service provider uh, put in, in his mind that this person is from different culture and may they don't, they have a, lots of barriers, they have a trauma from previous, uh, you know, experience, they have a language barrier, they don't, they have a low knowledge, maybe they don't, they don't have education even in first language. So they put in their mind that there is lots of things happening in one person. So, you know, be careful and provide, you know, give more information and explain about the service that provide for that person. So in that case, that person know what's their right. So they will get that, uh, you know, the right service and they will not, you know, disappoint because I hear many, many stories and many experience from different people that they said that we tried, we tried, we went to different places, but it's, it's just wasting time and we didn't get rec received any service. Maybe because they went in, in the wrong service. They don't know the right service provider and they went different. And then in the end, they will dis disappoint and they will give up. Mm -hmm. So if they know the right and they know where to go, the right place, so in the beginning, they will, ac uh, uh, per they will access the right service and not disappoint and not give up and, yeah. And Mushkan, you talked about the importance of building the house slowly and not a rush. So what would be the important matters now to help the community? To be honest, the main issue with my community is the first issue is to solve the interpreting problem first, to be honest. There's no point of having different organization in the community while the community does not understand how to get that information in the first language. That's the first step, being able to give the, the, like the person who gave the information into the first language. For example, if I actually explain, if I run a class and I explain it in my first language, no one's in here will understand. I might say the same information, the information that everyone, all the people know in this room. There's no point of me running that class when there's no one in this room will understand. That's what happens when you give a person an information or running a session, regards to what, if, what information it is. There's no point of running it when you don't, that person know what's going on at that, in this room, on, on the room. The last part is to go to NDIS is for cult communities, it's hard. It's hard for us to grab those documentation to approve that the child have learning difficulties. First of all, as I mentioned it, through the Department of Education, it takes years to approve by the time you did the test with the students, whether they are have learning difficulties 
or not. The second problem is again interpreting, which will double the time. The forms that are we just start with the cult community regards to the NDIS. And to be honest, I have experienced a lot of challenges from the community, which we always do. Anything that relates to disability, we face the challenges. When a few people step in from the community, then the rest of community followed the same path. At the moment, the forms that I say that we have applied for this amount of people since June, these people has been lost hope. If this stay back, God knows how these children, if the family said no, then we can't do anything. I'm not sure about the legal side, how they're going to go legally to encourage the families to do the NDIS form. I hope this is, this is what I'm scared of. If these families spirit, like, send the word, like tell the rest of the community, this is what happened to us and this is how long we have been through. And the God, this is like how we are going around the circle. There's no way that we can, even we as a community leaders, will be able to help the cult community to apply for India is because once we lost the trust, that's it. Okay. Yep. Um, I'll check with the commissioners now if the commissioners have any questions they want to ask you. Yes, thank you very much. I'll first ask Commissioner McEwen if he has any questions. Thank you, Chair. And thank you to each of you for coming today and providing your evidence and your experiences. I just have one question. You were explaining about the shame of families when they have a disabled child or a disabled member of the family. Other witnesses today and yesterday have described that similar type of thing. I'm just wondering, what type of support do the families need to make sure that that child with the disability can grow up and develop a positive identity and confidence within themselves so that they are ready to go out into society? How can we make sure that that child builds that confidence um, for their ongoing life? Um, learning support is important, especially for the a new arrival. And this is, you know, what is make many, many, many uh, example. I saw they care for the, they lost drugs habit or they not working. So from the beginning to diagnose the um, learning um, or learning difficulty, learning English, that's, that's important from my experience. I don't know, I just, do you have any other? From my experience, the, the forms, when I actually apply for uh, in DIS, to be honest, stop making people going around the circle. If the information that you need, they refer them to GP. GP doesn't have us help them. They say it's, it's taking a lot of time. We are unable to help. So and there will be there needs to be a clear instruction. What are the steps you need to be taken? and how long it will take. So that way people doesn't feel that they have been excluded and has been going around the circle. And the other thing is that, you know, the uh, school is very important teacher, like child teacher is very important because the child, uh, is, you know, teacher being half of the day with the child and realize the child's you know, difficulties and what is it's need. So the, the teacher can explain that to the peer, to that uh, it can explain that to parents and say that the child has that, that disability. And if you like, there is just that support and service for, uh, available for that child. So we can, you know, that's become better for, for her, for her future and, uh, this is the outcome of uh, accessing that service. So maybe the parents feel that, okay, it's okay. It's benefit for our children to be better. But many parents, they think that if the child has a disability, it means they will stay that, that there is no improvement and they will 
Okay. They will have no future. So they, that's why they are hiding that, the, you know, issues. So when, if the teacher explain that to the parents, it will affect a lot, I think. Sorry, um, I just actually didn't explain the question properly. The way that actually with us say stop going around the circle because the more time it takes and instead of actually if there's a short um, waiting list, then that way, one once what happens with the call community? If it this they need someone from the community to stand up and go through that process, once it's achieved then the rest of the community will say, yes, it's working. It worked for that child. It will work for my child as well. Thank you. And Zara, thank you for that explanation. And maybe this relates to peer support. Having peer support for that child and that family is important. Is that in a nutshell what you were getting at? I think so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for today. You've given some strong messages about the NDIS in your experience, but many services uh, for people with disability are not provided by the NDIS. Only a small proportion of the community um, of people with disability uses the NDIS. Is your message also to state governments on the services they provide such as support for drug addiction or mental health. Is it the same message that you would like to give to those other health service providers um, that you've given today about the NDIS? Definitely, yeah, for um, mental health and uh, about the drug as well. Um, uh, we, we definitely need to send this message. Um, Maternal care. Yes. Early. Then, yeah, childhood care, care yeah, yeah. yeah, family care. Uh, there is a lot of uh, other organization. They um, either they not you know overwork or they not doing their their uh, job probably with the call community. Thank you. And I think you know, um, you know, there is few few organization that is not working with the NDIS. But I think we are one community and we, each of us must affect to the other person. And we have may have someone's we need to support them, even we are not like I'm not working for the in the IS, but I I there is part of my work is like support that person. If like every organization has a little bit of uh, information about the other support service, so they can provide that information to the to the individuals. And it's will, you know, the, that makes that, the, that person have the right support. We've uh, heard evidence uh, from people from regional communities before. Our very first uh, hearing, in fact, was <coughs> in Townsville in Queensland. But uh, I'd be very interested to know what you feel about the support that you've received from people within the local community who are not part of the cultural and linguistically diverse community. Do you feel that you've received support, uh, that uh, you are assisted in the work that you seek to do and to address the problems that you've identified? Um, you mean for the drugs and alcohol problem or other problem? I'm not talking about the drugs. No, no, I'm talking about uh, the kinds of problems that you've each uh, spoken about of people understanding their entitlements or being directed to the correct agencies to receive the supports that uh, they need. I'm just wondering whether you feel that there is support from the broader community of which you are part. Yeah, uh, we got support. Like uh, for me, I got the support from my Australian friends and um, the first person, um, Chris, my friend, she's here. She's the first one uh, to support me and to direct me to the uh, right services. Uh, also, my other friend, Lorna, she's um, when she when when I first arrived, she's supporting me to get the right, you know, um, things or right uh, 
support from uh, other organizations. From my community, as we talk, the mental health or other problem, it's it's been hitting, you know, no, no one talk about it to, to get the support from others. The problem is in ongoing, uh, either for the drugs or for the uh, mental health. It's a big, big uh, issue there in, in our community. It's not been um, something we talk about it. I, I think there is a support available from broader communities, but the problem is that the community need to find out. And uh, from the, my community, like the suburb that I'm living is very multicultural, but the problem is that many families, many you know, members of families, they are not connected, they are not engaging with the border community and they think that they are separate. Like, they even like you know the children they are in same same house they are going to the school and the moms are uneducated as the, like parents staying home there there is not communicating there is not engaging between the parents and children they are having uh, you know the the children are having australian culture they are behaving as australian culture the parents is in afghan culture or the, Mm -hmm. you know, home culture, and they have a big gap. And that that's parents, they don't have that engagement with the border community. You know, they, they are only with their community friends from mm -hmm. same some same culture. They don't have that engagement, you know. The, the support is available, but as I mentioned, the support is available into English, but not in first language. So there's no point of having support around you when you don't understand. Of course, yes. Well, thank you very much. I know that things have not been easy in the Golden Valley of late, so that it uh, must have been very difficult for you to come here to Melbourne to give evidence. So we're very grateful for you being to be for being prepared to make that very considerable effort to come to the Royal Commission today in Melbourne. Thank you very much uh, for, uh, uh, for that. And we also know that it's not uh, easy to talk about personal experiences. Uh, and uh, we appreciate that you have been prepared to do that and to share your own experiences and your own uh, stories uh, with us. And we also want to thank you for the work uh, that you are doing, which is really very, very important. And uh, the people within your community should be, and I'm sure they are, extremely grateful to you for the contribution that you So thank you very much for assisting us today. We have each learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to and I want to thank you and everyone here that give us that opportunity to be a, you know, sons of our being, you know, talk about our culture and our, uh, you know, the these issues that we have, we facing, and you know, talk about it and you know, make a change for our community. It's actually a privilege for us to be able to hear. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Eastman, today uh, we have finished. That concludes the evidence for today, and we'll resume tomorrow at ten a.m. Thank you very much, Ronald. The Royal Commission is adjourned.